With Halloween right around the corner, hopefully if this video is done on time, what better way to celebrate than to tackle one of the most beloved horror game series of all time, Silent Hill. Now, while I'm going to try to cover this as in depth as I can, do note that most of the Silent Hill games feature a bevy of multiple endings, and in this video I'm going to feature what I, as well as many others in the community, personally feel to be the best or most accurate ending to each game's story, but I will occasionally mention some other of the ending's possibilities in passing. This does not include the secret UFO joke endings, unfortunately. Now, I'm going to try to keep things as chronological as I can, but as I always do in this series, I'm going to focus mostly on the events of the games themselves, touching on relevant background lore as needed. As such, some events may be covered a bit out of order, just to keep certain reveals and twists intact. Do note that I will be covering the remake slash reimagining Silent Hill Shattered Memories on its own at the end of the video due to its story existing in a completely different universe than the mainline titles. Also, given that the now delisted playable teaser, or PT, of the cancelled installment Silent Hills is Konami's final release Silent Hill property as of this video's production, I'll touch on that as well. However, some games, namely the mobile installments, will not be covered for various reasons. I will also be skipping over the two Silent Hill films, as they are also unrelated to the narrative of the game series. However, as a bonus, I will be covering the various Silent Hill comics that have been released over the years through IDW, and I'll try to fit them into the narrative as best I can, but take them with a grain of salt as their canonicity is debated amongst the community. There are also some Japan-exclusive comics that I'll be skipping since I couldn't get my hands on them. Also, I'm not covering Dead by Daylight Silent Hill DLC. You can feel free to complain about everything I'm missing in the comments. Oh, and by the way, given that this is yet another huge undertaking, I've once again enlisted the help of the best Let's Play channel on YouTube, the 2-Bit Players. All right, Josh, I'm excited. I learned my lesson this time. No more swearing. That's right, Jeffrey's been practicing. We're ready to go. Let's f do this. Now, with quite possibly the most disclaimer-filled intro I've ever done out of the way, without further ado, this is what you need to know about Silent Hill. Our story begins in the year 1867, where we find settlers Jebediah Foster and his pregnant wife Esther traveling to Silent Hill. On their way, they meet the town's postmaster, Howard Blackwood, who is on his way to the nearby town of Shepherd's Glen. He welcomes them into the town and wishes them luck before riding off, leaving them to enter the town of Silent Hill. The pair ride through the town and find Esther's family home, where they begin to settle in. As Jeb throws away a ruined chair in the nearby woods, however, a strange skeletal creature watches over him. He makes his way to the barn, as the creature follows, where he finds a jar of whiskey, which reminds him of a contract hit job he had taken previously. Just then, he hears Esther scream from inside the house, and he runs in to investigate, finding a Native American woman with bloody hands on the floor. She states that the whiskey is her first gift, referring to some unknown third party. As Jeb runs off to find bandages for the woman's cuts, she speaks with Esther, warning her that Jeb is a man who has done evil things, and their baby may turn out to be the same. She then leaves the knife she cut herself with as she walks out of the house, referring to Jeb as Hell Rider. At night, Jeb begins to have nightmares about the creature from the woods, which watches over him through the window. In the morning, an angered Jeb decides to take the knife to the sheriff so he can do something about the woman who came into their house. Jeb rides into town and approaches the sheriff's department, but finds it locked. Howard Blackwood arrives and tells Jeb that Sheriff Seth Creviston is down at the Toluca prison. Jeb heads into the nearby Leek's Tavern to grab a bite to eat, and inside he orders a coffee. The bartender Jonas is surprised, stating that this isn't his usual order, which confuses Jeb as this is the first time he's come to the tavern. Just then, Jonas' wife Helene walks in and recognizes Jeb as Hellrider, referring to some kind of past together between the three of them before mentioning a big knife Jeb used to own. As the three begin to argue, Sheriff Creviston walks into the tavern and meets with Jeb. Jeb tells him about the trespasser at his home, and the sheriff hints at some kind of history between him and Jeb as well, before inviting him back to his station to discuss further. At the station, Jeb and the sheriff talk about the former's past, and he explains that he used to be a heavy drinker, but gave it up before he and his wife moved to Silent Hill to start a new life. Jeb changes the subject to his intruder, and the sheriff explains that it must be an old woman named Enola, who is a bit strange, but ultimately harmless. Jeb then leaves, stating that if Enola shows up again, it'll be her last time, and as he leaves, the sheriff also refers to him as Hellrider. Meanwhile, back at the house, the skeletal creature begins to watch over Esther as she collapses on the porch. When she awakens, she finds Enola before her, and the old woman helps her inside the house. The two then have a conversation, and Enola cryptically states that she and others have been awaiting her child's birth. She then leaves before Jeb returns home. 
Weeks later, as Jeb cuts the chair into firewood, he begins to remember his days when he went by Hellrider, including an incident where he slept with Helene. Jonas caught the two, and in a rage he tried to stab Jeb, but he pulled Helene in front of him, causing Jonas to kill his own wife instead. Jeb then pulled his shotgun and blew Jonas away, leaving the couple dead as he walked out. Just as Jeb comes to this realization, Howard Blackwood arrives once again to check in on Jeb and see how he and his wife have settled in. The pair speak about killing people in their past, and Jeb recounts his days as Hellrider, when he drank whiskey and killed with no remorse before Esther got him clean. He then states that some of the murders were killing Native Americans to free land for the rich and powerful, but he doesn't count that. Howard then ominously states that in Silent Hill, it all counts, before he rides off. Later, Jeb takes Esther to the church in Silent Hill, and they listen to a sermon where Reverend Stone mentions lost sheep, triggering another memory of Jeb's Hellrider days in which he met with Sheriff Creviston while roasting a sheep they stole from a farm. During the confrontation, Jeb sliced the sheriff's eye with his giant knife. As Jeb looks over at the sheriff in the church, he notices his damaged eye and giant scar, causing him to grab Esther and return to their carriage to go home. Once they arrive, Jeb sends Esther inside and heads to the barn, where he grabs the bottle of whiskey and drinks as the skeletal creature, now revealed to be pregnant, appears behind him. Meanwhile, inside the house, Esther begins to go into labor, and Enola mysteriously arrives, her hands bloody once again, and sinisterly offers to help. Esther shouts for Jeb, and he hears her outside. As he goes in to check on her, he's stopped by the ghostly apparition of Helene. As he tries to escape from her, Enola introduces Esther to her daughter, Awanita, the skeletal creature. Jeb kills Helene, but is stopped again by Jonas, and then again by Sheriff Creviston, and he kills them both. Back in Silent Hill, Howard Blackwood notices the sheriff's office and the tavern ignite into flames, and he rides towards the Foster's home. Inside the house, the creature that was Awanita inhabits Esther's body, and it's revealed that the woman was once alive, but while she was giving birth, her village was attacked by Hellrider, who killed her and her baby. Esther gives birth, and Enola takes the baby from her just as Jeb arrives. Enola then leaves with the child as Jeb and Esther die in the house as it burns to the ground. Outside, Howard arrives and watches the Inferno, asking Enola about the baby and the fires. Enola responds that the baby is her daughter, Awanita, and the fires burn for the spirits in the town, as they're done being silent, and furthermore states that they've only just begun. A century later, in the small, rural New England town of Silent Hill, we find truck driver Travis Grady passing through on his way to the city of Brahms. While driving, Travis has visions of a funeral before a cloaked figure steps out into the road, forcing him to come to a forceful stop. After he exits his vehicle to check on the figure, he finds it gone, and in its place is a young girl in a blue school uniform. He follows the girl, eventually coming upon a burning house. Travis sees a woman outside the house, but he soon hears a girl screaming from inside, forcing him to run in. Inside the fiery blaze, Travis finds a girl alive but charred, lying on top of a painted seal seemingly as some sort of ritual. She asks Travis to leave her there to burn, but he picks her up and carries her out of the house. Outside, however, he collapses, just as sirens begin to be heard in the distance. Travis awakens the next day to find himself on a bench within Silent Hill, which he finds to be enveloped in a fog. Concerned about the girl's condition, Travis decides to head to the nearby Alcamilla Hospital in order to find and check on her. There, Travis meets Dr. Michael Kaufman, who claims to know nothing about the burned girl, revealing that the hospital did not admit any new patients in the past day or two. He then rushes off, leaving Travis alone in the hospital, where he finds a disfigured, otherworldly nurse who attacks him. Travis fights his way past the creature and finds a mirror, where he sees the girl in the blue uniform in its reflection. When Travis touches the mirror, he finds himself on the other side of the reflection, inside a bloody, twisted version of the hospital. After working his way through both versions of the hospital, Travis encounters a monster resembling a patient in a straitjacket, and he defeats it to find a mysterious pyramid-shaped item on the ground, surrounded by the same seal he found the burned girl on. After he picks the item up, he sees the girl in the uniform once again, before he passes out once again shortly after. Travis awakens back in the normal version of the hospital, where he meets a trainee nurse named Lisa Garland, who reveals that the girl in the fire, named Alessa Gillespie, died from her wounds. Lisa then rushes off to meet Dr. Kaufman in the Cedar Grove Sanitarium, and Travis follows shortly after to learn more about the town's events. 
On the way, however, Travis finds the town to be overrun with monsters, and he soon comes across a giant one resembling a butcher which viciously murders one of the nurse monsters before walking off. Travis finds the sanitarium and comes across the woman he saw outside the burning house. The woman, Dahlia Gillespie, reveals that the house was hers, and the girl who was burned was her daughter. The woman cryptically tells Travis not to trust Lisa, and warns him that there's more to the town of Silent Hill than he may realize. Travis explores the sanitarium and finds that it has its own otherworldly counterpart. While traversing through, Travis learns that his own mother, Helen, had tried to kill him when he was a child, resulting in her admittance to the sanitarium. In the other world, Travis finds a manifestation of his mother and is forced to kill the creature. Afterward, he finds another pyramid-shaped item, and the girl in the uniform, an unburned manifestation of Alessa, appears and once again causes him to pass out. When Travis wakes up, he finds a ticket to a show at the local Artaud Theater, and makes his way there to investigate. Once he reaches the theater, Travis finds Lisa inside, who tells Travis of her dreams of becoming an actress, displaying her talents before walking off. Travis explores the theater, learning of Alessa's fear of the Shakespearean creature, the Caliban, who would use her supernatural abilities to telepathically torment its actor in retaliation. Travis comes across an otherworldly manifestation of the Caliban and defeats it to find another pyramid object, as well as Alessa once more. While Travis now expects the girl, he is unable to prevent her from once again causing him to lose consciousness. Travis then awakens in the theater, finding a key to the nearby motel where he had stayed as a child. Travis makes his way to the hotel, where he is forced to traverse the fog-filled world as well as the rusted, bloody otherworld while reliving his previous trips there with his father while they stayed in the town to visit his committed mother. Eventually, Travis is forced to battle the giant, butcher-like creature he saw earlier, eventually killing the beast with its own cleaver. Travis continues searching the motel, finding more evidence of his parents' extremely strained relationship before coming across Lisa and Dr. Kaufman together on a bed in a room filled with an unknown drug. The pair scurry off, and Travis finds the key to room 500, where he stayed with his father as a child. When he enters the room, Travis relives his memory of finding his dead father hanging from a noose inside the room. Travis then witnesses his father's corpse in the other world awakening to tell him to face his demons. He then transforms into an unnatural monster that Travis is forced to kill. After he does, he finds the final pyramid-shaped piece, as well as Alessa, who he now realizes has dug up his parents in order to torment him. While he tries to confront her, she is able to psychopathically overpower him and cause him to pass out once again. When Travis awakens, he finds the final piece of the pyramid-shaped item and is able to combine all of his pieces to create the Floros, an item he's read about that holds some kind of mystical power related to Alessa's. Alessa appears to him afterward, before quickly vanishing. Travis returns to the streets of Silent Hill, finding Dahlia, who chastises him for breaking the spell and freeing Alessa. Travis asks for Dahlia's help, but she simply warns him that Alessa will soon give birth to God. As Travis turns around, he witnesses Alessa rise from the ground and transform the fog-filled town of Silent Hill into an otherworldly hellscape. Travis is able to escape to the Green Lion Antiques Shop, where he finds a hidden passageway leading to a room housing several members of a cult-like group called The Order, who look over Alessa's burned physical body, which they hope to use as a vessel to bring forth the birth of their god. Dr. Kaufman reveals himself as one of the members and knocks Travis out with sleeping gas. Dahlia, also revealed to be a member of the Order, states that they must contain Travis in a cage for a demon. Travis then finds himself inside some kind of nightmare reality where he is forced to fight a demon of Alessa's dreams. After he emerges victorious, Travis regains the Floros and uses it to destroy the demon. Back in Silent Hill, Travis awakens to find the Floro shooting a beam of light at Alessa's burned body, causing an infant-like shape to emerge from her. Afterward, Travis emerges to find himself in the real world, where he comes across his truck. He gets in and sees Alessa in his rearview mirror holding a newborn child. Travis simply smiles, resets his odometer, and drives off, leaving his past, the town of Silent Hill, and Alessa Gillespie behind. 
Afterward, a couple, Harry and Jody Mason, find the newborn on the side of the road and they adopt the child, naming her Cheryl. The Order then realizes that this part of Alessa's soul has gone missing, causing the seed of their god to lay dormant. They then determine that they can bring the other half of her soul back using a summoning spell, but realize that this will take some time. Around seven years later, Harry Mason takes Cheryl back to Silent Hill on vacation after the death of his wife Jody a few years prior. Shortly after a police officer passes Harry, he spots her bike crash on the side of the road. Harry then notices a girl in a blue uniform in the road and swerves to avoid hitting her, causing him to crash his car off the side of the road, knocking him unconscious in the process. When Harry awakens, he notices Cheryl's missing and emerges from his car to find himself in the fog and snow-filled town of Silent Hill, where he begins to search for his daughter. Before he can get too far, however, the area transforms into the dark other world, and Harry is attacked by small, monstrous creatures which overwhelm him before he passes out. Harry later regains consciousness in a diner where he is greeted by the police officer he saw earlier, who introduces herself as Sybil Bennett from the neighboring Brahms Police Department. Sybil shares Harry's confusion with what's going on in the town and leaves him with a pistol to protect himself as she heads off to call for reinforcements. As Harry prepares to continue his search for Cheryl, a nearby portable radio begins to emit a staticky noise, and suddenly, a flying monster crashes through the diner window, forcing Harry to open fire and kill it. Harry works his way back to where he was attacked and finds a note seemingly left by Cheryl, noting that she has gone to the nearby Midwich Elementary School. Harry makes his way through the school, as well as its otherworldly counterpart, finding a large, circular seal painted on the ground of the courtyard. He eventually finds a large, lizard-like creature called Splithead, which he defeats, returning him to the fog-filled world. He then spots the girl he saw in the middle of the road, but she quickly vanishes into thin air. As he exits the school, Harry hears the bells of the nearby Balkan church, and he heads there to investigate. Inside, Harry meets Dahlia Gillespie, who gives him the fluoros and tells him to make his way to the hospital before cryptically exiting. Harry makes his way to the Alcamilla Hospital and enters it to find a man with a gun who shoots at him when he enters. Harry diffuses the situation, and the man introduces himself as Dr. Michael Kaufman, who claims to be just as bewildered about the current state of Silent Hill before he grabs his briefcase and hurries out. Harry then finds a box of smashed vials containing an unknown red liquid, and he can optionally take a sample of the liquid with him. Harry fights through the Otherworld version of the hospital, finding monstrous nurses, as well as the girl in the blue uniform, who he learns is Alessa Gillespie, a patient at the hospital, along the way until he comes across a frightened nurse, Lisa Garland. However, during their conversation, Harry's head begins to hurt, and he passes out once more. When Harry awakens, he finds himself back in the fog world, with Dahlia Gillespie waiting for him inside Dr. Kaufman's office. She tells him not to let the symbol he saw in the schoolyard be completed, which she refers to as the Mark of Samael. She leaves him the key for Green Lion Antiques and tells him that the other church in town is his next destination. Inside the antique shop, Harry finds the secret passageway and is quickly met by Sybil. Sybil tells Harry that she saw a girl by the lake, which Harry assumes to be Cheryl. Sybil also reveals that there's an issue with drug trafficking in the town, but the police force has no leads on who's behind it. Harry then enters the passageway alone and finds a an hidden altar with a chalice full of an unknown powder, which suddenly begins to burn. Sybil enters the passageway to investigate, but finds no trace of Harry inside. Meanwhile, Harry awakens inside the otherworld version of the hospital, with Lisa sitting before him. Lisa fills Harry in on some of the background of the town, including a strange religion its inhabitants used to follow and tells him about Dahlia's daughter dying in a fire years ago. Harry then mysteriously finds himself waking up again in a bed, and he exits into the otherworld version of the town to reach the Silent Hill Town Center shopping mall, where he sees a video playing of a captive Cheryl. Harry then falls through a faulty walkway and battles a large, worm-like creature called the Twin Feeler, which he swiftly defeats. He then returns to the hospital and reunites with Lisa to ask her how to get to the lake. She gives him directions to go through the sewers, but asks him not to leave as she feels safe. However, she won't leave with him as she feels like she isn't supposed to. 
Harry promises to return and heads off, fighting the evolved form of the twin feeler, the flying float stinger, on his way. The end of this battle brings him to the fog world, where he enters the sewers, fighting through various monsters before emerging into the resort area of the town. Here, Harry can optionally enter Annie's bar, where he rescues Kaufman from an attacking monster. Afterward, Kaufman leaves, and Harry finds a key and a note, which lead him to a store called The Indian Runner, where he opens a safe to find a cache of drugs, as well as an article containing the recreational drug PTV, the same one being trafficked around Silent Hill. This leads Harry to a motorcycle, and when he opens the gas tank, he finds a vial like the broken ones in the hospital. Kaufman arrives suddenly and scolds Harry, taking the vial from him and scurrying off, leading Harry to surmise that he must somehow be involved in the local drug trade. The town then shifts to the other world again, and Harry rushes to the docks to reunite with Sybil in a boat. The pair discuss their next steps, and Dahlia enters to interrupt them. She again warns Harry to stop the mark of Samael from being completed before his daughter is used as a sacrifice. She then sends him to the lighthouse on the lake, while Sybil goes to the center of the amusement park. Harry reaches the lighthouse and climbs it to find Alessa, standing atop the mark of Samael before vanishing. Harry then makes haste to the amusement park to hopefully beat Alessa there. When Harry arrives, however, he is shocked to find Sybil seemingly possessed, who attacks him on the carousel. At this point, Harry can either kill Sybil to stop her, or throw the sample of the red liquid he found at the hospital on her, ridding her of the mind-controlling parasite and saving her. Afterward, Harry finds Alessa once again, but she telekinetically pushes him away. Harry then notices the florus glowing, and he grabs it, unknowingly activating it. It blasts Alessa with some kind of energy, incapacitating her. Dahlia then arrives and confronts Alessa, revealing that the girl had somehow escaped their spell, and that she used Harry to capture her. She then tells the girl that there is one more thing she needs from her before the two disappear into the glow of the floros. Harry then awakens once again in a hospital room with Lisa, this time in Nowhere, a physical manifestation of Alessa's memories. Lisa runs off, forcing Harry to find his own way through the distorted labyrinth to find her once again. Lisa realizes that she's no different than the monsters around them, and she suddenly begins to bleed from every orifice, forcing Harry to lock her away behind him. Afterward, Harry re-enters the room to find that Lisa is now missing, but notices her diary in her place. Reading it, he learns that Lisa was addicted to the PTV drug and that she was the nurse attending to Alessa, although she tried to reason with Kaufman to let her quit, as the girl frightened her. Harry eventually finds Alessa's room in Nowhere and witnesses the memory of Dahlia, Kaufman, and two other members of the Order discussing her soul splitting in two, as well as how they can bring the halves back together to initiate the birth of their god. Harry finally finds Dahlia, as well as Sybil if he had saved her, alongside Alessa in a bandaged figure in a wheelchair. The figure, it is soon revealed, is a fully reformed Alessa. Dahlia explains that Cheryl was the result of Alessa's soul splitting into a new child, but she has now been reunited. The girl Harry had seen around town was Alessa, astral projecting herself to draw the seal of Metatron around the town, attempting to stop the god from being birthed from her. Dahlia had manipulated Harry into stopping Alessa, and now the god is set to arrive. Just then, Alessa appears as the white glowing incubator. Suddenly, Kaufman, if he was saved by Harry, appears and shoots Dahlia, incapacitating her. Kaufman pulls out another vial of the red liquid, which Dahlia refers to as the Agleophotus, and he throws it at the incubator, causing a giant monster called the Incubus, which immediately burns and kills Dahlia. Harry then fights the creature, finally killing it and preventing the birth of the Order's god through Alessa. After the battle, Harry sees the Incubator return to the form of Alessa, now holding a newborn baby. She hands the baby to Harry and creates an opportunity for him, and potentially Sybil and Kaufman, to escape the other world. Kaufman doesn't get the chance, however, as a still bloody Lisa appears and drags him to the depths below as the others make their escape while the incubator burns to death behind. Finally, outside the town, Harry, potentially alongside Sybil, takes the newborn girl and heads off to raise her as his own daughter once again. If you'd like to see a full Let's Play of that game, click the link!
please subscribe. Sometime later, inside the Heaven's Night Gentlemen's Club in Silent Hill, a woman named Maria wakes up and finds herself in the town, which is crawling with monsters. She holds a gun, contemplating using it on herself, but instead feels compelled to find someone else in the town. She explores the town and finds a mansion owned by Ernest Baldwin. Inside, she speaks with the agoraphobic man through the door of his room, but he simply asks her to go away. In the attic, Maria finds a note from Ernest's daughter Amy, and she returns it to Ernest, who reveals that his daughter is dead, and asks Maria to retrieve a bottle of white liquid for him, which he can use to bring back his daughter. Maria retrieves the bottle from an apartment complex next door and returns it to Ernest. The man thanks her for bringing him the only item he couldn't get himself before revealing something to her, that a man, a bad man, named James Sunderland will be coming to the town soon to look for the you that isn't you. Maria begins to remember the man but believes him to be kind. Maria then opens the door to Ernest's room but shockingly finds it to be completely empty. Maria then steps out into the streets of Silent Hill and holds her gun up to her head. She takes a moment but decides to throw the gun over a nearby wall before walking deep into the fog of the town to look for James. Meanwhile, James Sunderland arrives in Silent Hill. James traveled to the town after receiving a letter seemingly from his wife, Mary, who had fallen ill with a disease and passed away three years earlier, stating that she is currently waiting for him at their special place. Knowing that he had promised to take Mary back to Silent Hill before she died, James went to the town to uncover the truth behind the letter. Just outside the town, James comes across a graveyard where he meets a woman named Angela Orozco, who is also looking for someone, her mother. Angela warns James to stay out of the town, as something appears to be wrong with it. James wishes her luck in finding her mother, but ignores her warning and heads into the town. There, James finds it to be nothing like the rich resort town it had been when he had previously visited with Mary, instead finding it to be a fog-filled hellscape filled with monsters. James fights off the monsters, working his way to the Rosewater Park by the lake. However, he soon finds his path blocked, forcing him to instead explore the town to find another route, locating it through an apartment complex which he enters. Inside, James finds a flashlight as well as a key behind a locked gate. When he tries to grab the key, however, a little girl stomps on his hand and kicks the key out of reach before running off. James then finds a handgun before coming across a unique, powerful enemy with a giant cleaver and a red, pyramid-like helmet on his head, having its way with two other enemies. James shoots at the creature, and it disappears, allowing him to continue through the complex. James soon finds an apartment with a dead man in the refrigerator. He hears noises in the bathroom and enters to find another man vomiting into the toilet. This man, Eddie Dombrowski, claims to have nothing to do with the dead man, stating that he entered the apartment to flee from the monsters and found the corpse inside just as James did. James tells Eddie to be careful and heads off to continue his search. James is able to jump to the neighboring apartment complex, and there he finds Angela laying on the floor with a knife in her hand. While she's overcome with self-loathing, James is able to talk her into handing him the knife, but as he tries to take it, she screams and runs off, leaving it behind. James takes it and tries to leave the apartment complex, but he is stopped by the Pyramid Head monster. After a short while, a siren begins to blare in the distance, and the creature leaves James by descending into a flooded stairwell. Outside the apartments, James finds the little girl who stepped on his hand. The girl cryptically states that James didn't love Mary anyway before running off, leaving a very confused James behind. James finally reaches Rosewater Park, where he finds Maria. James is shocked to find that Maria looks and sounds identical to his late wife Mary, but the woman knows nothing about her. Maria asks James if he had any other special place with his late wife, and he speculates that it might be the Lakeview Hotel. Maria then accompanies James as he makes his way to the hotel. James finds Pete's Bolarama and enters to find Eddie once again, who reveals that he was just speaking with the little girl, who he calls Laura. James leaves to chase after Laura, but finds that the girl had slipped past Maria. The pair follow Laura's path, passing through Heaven's Night on the way. Outside, they see Laura run into the Brookhaven Hospital and follow her inside. There, James is forced to fight several nurse-like monsters, and eventually, Maria falls ill and elects to rest on one of the hospital beds while James continues to look for Laura. On the roof, James finds a diary from a suicidal patient before Pyramid Head appears and knocks him off the rooftop. James survives the fall and eventually finds Laura. 
He asks the girl how she knows Mary, and the girl claims that they met at the hospital last year. James doesn't believe her, as Mary had already been dead, but he leaves with the girl anyway. Laura then tells James she has a letter from Mary and sends him into a room alone to retrieve it. When James does this, however, Laura locks him inside, and he's ambushed by two hanging monsters, which he is able to defeat. After the battle, the hospital begins to transform, and James emerges within its otherworld counterpart. James returns to the room he left Maria in, but finds her to be missing. He eventually reunites with her in the basement of the hospital, but she meets him with anger, frustrated that he left her for dead. She comes to her senses, however, and realizes that they need to find Laura and get out of the hospital. The pair are soon attacked by Pyramid Head, oh God. who gives chase. James and Maria are separated when James enters an elevator, and the door closes behind him. On the other side, Pyramid Head catches Maria and instantly kills her with one swift swing of his giant blade. James takes a moment to collect himself before continuing on, finding a reference to something at the Rosewater Park. When James returns, he finds a key buried under a statue, which he learns opens the front door to the Silent Hill Historical Society building. The building soon transforms into an otherworld representation of a prison, and in its cafeteria, James finds Eddie, musing about how easy it was to kill a man who made fun of him. James scolds Eddie for killing someone, but Eddie laughs and admits it was just a joke before leaving. James continues until he enters a room where he is surprised to find Maria, still very much alive, behind a set of jail cell bars. James expresses his confusion about her survival, but Maria simply states that they got separated in the basement, but has no recollection of being attacked. Maria then jokes that James has a history of being forgetful, and mentions a time when he left a videotape they made in a hotel room. James begins to question her true identity, but Maria simply states that she is there for him, and asks him to release her. James continues through the Otherworld Labyrinth, reuniting with Angela, who he learns killed her sexually abusive father. He saves her from a monster representing her father, but she distrusts him, calling him a liar who didn't want Mary around anymore before she runs off. James reaches the inside of Maria's cell, but finds her dead and mutilated on the bed. James traverses through more of the labyrinth, finding Eddie in a room, who threatens to kill the next person who laughs at him. James asks Eddie if he's gone nuts, which angers the man, prompting a fight between the two. James is forced to kill Eddie, and he immediately becomes overwhelmed with grief over killing another human. James exits the labyrinth and finds a boat outside, using it to reach the Lakeview Hotel. James finds Laura in the hotel restaurant, and the girl finally gives him the letter from Mary she tricked him with earlier. In the letter, which Laura took from their nurse, Rachel's locker, Mary tells Laura to trust James, as underneath his surly exterior, he's really a good person. She also tells Laura that she hoped to adopt the girl. This letter makes James believe that Mary must have not died three years ago, while Laura runs off to look for another letter from Mary that she has misplaced. James enters room 312, the room he and his wife stayed at on their previous vacation, and he watches the videotape he left there. The tape starts off showing James and Mary on their vacation, but then suddenly cuts to footage of James smothering his wife with a pillow and killing her. James then sits before the snow of the television static as he comes to grips with the truth behind his wife's death, as well as the guilt rushing over him. Laura runs in and tries to get James to come with her to find Mary, but James simply admits to her that he killed the woman. Laura screams at James before running out. As James stands alone in the hotel room, he hears a message on his radio from Mary begging him to come and find her. As James leaves the hotel, he finds Angela one last time, standing on a burning staircase. She initially believes James to be her mother, but quickly realizes who he is. Knowing there's no other escape from her pain, she asks James for her knife back, but he refuses. Angela then ascends the staircase, walking into the flames while James leaves. James reaches the hotel lobby, finding Maria once again alive. However, she is immediately killed by a pair of pyramid heads, and James realizes they, as well as Maria, came to exist to punish him for his sins and guilt of killing his wife. He then fights the creatures, eventually leading to them impaling themselves on their weapons, ending their existence as James's personal punishers. James then walks through a long hallway, recalling a memory when he tried to bring Mary flowers while she was hospitalized for her illness, but she was hostile with them, believing she looked like a monster and didn't deserve flowers. At this point, James's actions throughout his journey determine his outcome. In one instance, James finds a tall staircase, and at the top, he finally finds Mary, or at least a woman who looks like her. The woman offers to be the perfect wife like James wanted, but he refuses, 
triggering her transformation into a monster resembling his late wife's appearance on her hospital bed. After James defeats this creature, his journey through Silent Hill and his own personal punishment come to an end. James then finally gets one last moment with his wife, and Mary tells him that she wanted the pain to end to make him feel better for his actions, but he admits his motivations were selfish, as he just wanted his own life back. Mary doesn't believe this is fully true, as his guilt tells a different story. She then tells him that he has suffered enough, and hands him the letter professing her love and thanks to him before dying. James then carries her body out of the room and to his car. Inside his car, James finally realizes why he came to Silent Hill in the first place, to end his own suffering. He then drives his car into Toluca Lake to drown himself so the two can be together forever. Sometime later, a group of college students travels to Silent Hill to investigate the history of the Little Baroness, a boat that mysteriously sank in Toluca Lake 75 years prior. Two of the students, Eric and Tina, awaken the next day to find the town filled with fog and monsters, and the rest of the group missing. The pair then fight through various locations in the town, as well as their other world counterparts, to eventually find Tina's friend, a young girl named Emily, and the group finds the little baroness docked at Toluca Lake. Eventually, they learn that in 1918, a woman named Lorraine drowned her daughter Hannah by throwing her from the boat and it sank shortly after. The representation of Lorraine throws Emily to the bottom of the lake as well, and when Eric and Tina dive down, they find Hannah, who transforms into a giant monster. The pair defeat the monster, and Emily is rescued. Eric then notices that the monster is returning to its original form, and he pulls Hannah out of the lake. Hannah thanks Eric for rescuing her from the depths, and he then sees a vision of Hannah reuniting with her mother, while the captain of the boat, his great-grandfather, gives him a nod of approval. Seventeen years after Harry Mason left Silent Hill, his second adoptive daughter and reincarnation of Alessa Gillespie, named Heather Mason, falls asleep inside the Central Square Shopping Center and dreams of the Lakeside Amusement Park in Silent Hill, where she finds several monsters before being struck by a roller coaster car, shocking her awake. Heather then calls her father, Harry, from a payphone, and lets him know that she's on her way home. As she walks off, she is stopped by a detective named Douglas Cartland, who states that his employer wants to talk to her about her birth. Heather slips away into the women's room before climbing out the window. Unfortunately, she finds her path blocked and is forced to enter another door back into the mall, where she is met with a grisly sight. Heather finds that the mall is now filled with flesh-eating monsters, but she is luckily able to find a handgun to protect herself. Heather fights her way through the mall, soon coming across a woman in a black dress who introduces herself as Claudia who states that she needs the girl's power to lead them to paradise. She also tells Heather to remember her, as well as Heather's true self, before the girl feels a pain in her head as the woman walks off. Later, Heather finds an elevator and when she enters, she finds herself inside the hellish otherworld version of the mall. At the very bottom of the mall, Heather fights a giant worm-like creature and defeats it, returning the mall back to normal. As Heather goes to leave, Douglas stops her once again. Heather asks about Claudia, and Douglas reveals that she is his employer. Heather assumes that Douglas is somehow behind the monsters in the mall, but he acts just as surprised by them as she is. Heather leaves Douglas and enters the subway, only for it to also be inhabited by monsters. She uses the subway to reach a construction site before reaching the Hilltop Center, an office building that also transforms into the Otherworld. Heather explores the center, coming across a man named Vincent Smith, who recognizes her. Vincent reveals that while he is in the same cult as Claudia, the Order, he states that he isn't on her side. Heather walks off and is able to solve a riddle to return to the real world, where she is able to leave the Hilltop Center and return home to the Daisy Villa Apartments. Heather enters her apartment but is shocked to find her father, Harry Mason, murdered in the chair in their living room. Heather spots a trail of blood and follows it up the fire escape to the roof, where she finds Claudia, who states that Harry's murder was revenge for his crossing the Order 17 years ago by stopping their plan and taking Heather. She also states that by killing Harry, she has filled Heather's heart with hatred, something Heather will understand later. Claudia then reveals the Order's intention to have Heather birth their god and bring forth paradise before revealing Harry's true killer, a monster called the Missionary that attacks Heather as Claudia exits. Heather defeats the monster and returns to the apartment, finding Douglas examining Harry's body. 
Douglas expresses his condolences and helps Heather place her father's body in his bed before covering him with a sheet. Douglas asks Heather what's next, and she states that she's going to Silent Hill to find the Order and kill Claudia to avenge her father's death. Heather meets Douglas outside, who claims that he saw Vincent, who gave him a map of Silent Hill and instructions to find someone named Leonard Wolf when they get there. Douglas then hands Heather a notebook he found on Harry's person, in which he explains the truth behind Heather's birth and subsequent adoption. On the car ride to Silent Hill, Heather tells Douglas the story of Silent Hill and how Harry stopped Dahlia from sacrificing Alessa to rebirth the Order's God, and she admits that she fears Claudia is trying to use her to do the same. The pair reach Silent Hill and hole up in Jack's Inn before Douglas heads off to find Leonard at his house. Heather heads to Brookhaven Hospital, passing through Heaven's Night on the way. At the hospital, Heather finds notes and gifts from a patient named Stanley Coleman, who is seemingly infatuated with her. As Heather progresses, his notes get more and more hostile as she does not return his affection. Heather soon hears a phone ringing and answers it to find the man on the other end is Leonard Wolfe, who reveals himself to be Claudia's father. He asks Heather to come find and release him so he can help in stopping Claudia, and she agrees. However, as she looks for him, the hospital transforms into the other world. She has a vision of Lisa Garland, but doesn't fully remember the nurse. She then passes by a manifestation of her corpse on her way to find Leonard. When she finds the man, however, she learns that he is also a member of the Order, and he becomes upset when he learns that she is a non-believer. Leonard then emerges from a pool of water, revealing himself to be a monstrous creature. Heather kills Leonard and returns to the real world, where she finds a talisman with the seal of Metatron, which she takes as she heads back to the inn to return to Douglas. In their room, Vincent and Claudia argue about their religious beliefs, and Claudia chastises Vincent for leading Heather to her father, resulting in his death. Claudia leaves and Heather arrives shortly after, finding Vincent there. Vincent tells her that Douglas left her a message to go to the church on the other side of Toluca Lake to find Claudia. To get there, Heather must pass through the amusement park, where she relives the events of her nightmare the day before. Luckily, with her knowledge of what's coming, she's able to avoid getting hit by the roller coaster. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the park, Douglas confronts Claudia about hiring him under false pretenses. Claudia tries to explain that they must retrieve Heather so they can awaken Alessa and usher in their eternal paradise, a notion Douglas doesn't agree with, causing him to pull out his gun and set his sights on Claudia. Heather makes her way through a haunted mansion attraction and finds Douglas, incapacitated due to a broken leg, likely caused by his altercation with Claudia. Heather heads off to take care of Claudia, promising to come back once she's done. As she walks off, Douglas wonders if killing Heather is the only way he can prevent the birth of God, but he ultimately puts his gun down. Heather continues through the park, eventually reaching the same carousel where Harry encountered Sybil all those years ago. As the carousel turns into its otherworld representation, however, Heather sees a burned, black-haired doppelganger version of herself, the memory of Alessa Gillespie. After Heather defeats her counterpart, she finds a long passageway that leads to the Order's church. Inside, Heather finds Claudia, who again tells Heather that her true self must awaken. Heather then tells Claudia that she is Alessa and that she wants to leave the world as it is now. As they argue, however, Heather begins to feel a pain in her abdomen and collapses, giving Claudia a chance to walk away. Heather eventually finds Vincent, who tells her that she can use the seal of Metatron to stop Claudia from completing her plan. He then hands her a book explaining the seal's importance and walks off. Heather then travels through otherworld locations that mirror the memories of herself, her father, and Alessa Gillespie before finding Vincent and Claudia arguing. Vincent tells Heather to kill Claudia, and Claudia responds by stabbing the man in the back. Claudia then tries to reason with Heather about the birth of God, but a surviving Vincent tells Heather to use the seal. Heather takes it out, and Claudia reveals it's a useless piece of junk. She then stabs Vincent in the chest, finally killing him. Heather then begins to transform as she gets close to birthing the God inside her. She then opens a pendant she had since she was a child and ingests the Agleophotus inside. This chemical is the same one used 17 years prior to remove God from Alessa, and Heather vomits the fetal-like God on the ground. Claudia then rushes over and ingests it, hoping to birth God herself instead. She then begins to transform and falls down a nearby hole. Heather jumps down after her but finds her already dead. While Heather feels robbed of her vengeance, she is soon startled to see the giant, monstrous body of the birthed God. Heather fights and kills God, bringing an end to the Order's plans to use her, as well as avenging her father's death. 
She then takes a moment to remember her father before leaving the horrors she witnessed behind. Back outside, Heather reunites with Douglas, but as he notices her, she begins to approach him wielding a knife. As she draws closer, she jumps at him jokingly, revealing it to be a prank. Douglas calls her by her name, Heather, and she requests that he call her by the name her father gave her, Cheryl. The pair then leave, and the last we see of Cheryl is her visiting her father's grave after his burial. Sometime later, we find Henry Townsend in his apartment, room 302, in Ashfield, a town a few hours away from Silent Hill. One day, Henry awakens and is shocked to find his apartment door inexplicably chained and locked from the inside with a warning to not go out written by someone named Walter. After five days trapped in his apartment, Henry finds that a hole has mysteriously appeared in the wall of his bathroom. Henry climbs through the hole and emerges on the other end in an other world subway station, abandoned save for one woman named Cynthia Velasquez, who believes herself to be dreaming. The pair look for an exit, but Cynthia soon falls ill and runs into the restroom. As Henry waits for her, he is attacked by monstrous dog-like creatures. Henry fights off the creatures and heads into the restroom, finding Cynthia gone, and in her place, a bloody mannequin. Henry continues to explore the subway, getting attacked by ghosts on his way, before he finds Cynthia trapped in a train car. He is able to free her, and Cynthia finds the exit. Henry travels through more holes he finds back and forth to and from his apartment. When he eventually finds Cynthia, however, he finds her brutally attacked, and she dies from her wounds in his arms, with numbers carved into her chest. Henry awakens in his apartment and looks out the window to find paramedics retrieving a body from the nearby subway, one he assumes is Cynthia. In his apartment, Henry starts to find more things out of order. Mysterious letters are slipped under his door, a peephole to his neighbor Eileen Galvin's apartment suddenly appears, and the hole in his bathroom is getting bigger. Henry goes through a new hole in his apartment, now finding himself at the otherworld version of the Wish House Orphanage, where he finds a man named Jasper Geen, as well as a little boy. Later, though, Henry finds Jasper burning alive, carving numbers into his own chest. As Henry awakens back in his apartment once again, he hears a radio broadcast reporting Jasper's death, as well as noting its similarity to the modus operandi of a serial killer named Walter Sullivan who killed 10 people before committing suicide. However, his full methods were never released to the public, making the police fear the dead killer has somehow come back to finish his crimes. Through the notes slipped under his door, Henry learns from an article written by a journalist named Joseph Schreiber that Walter grew up at the Wish House Orphanage, which was really just a front for the Order, which would take in children and indoctrinate them into their twisted religion. Henry heads back into the hole and finds himself in an otherworld water treatment facility where a man, Andrew DeSalvo, is currently held captive in a cell. Inside, Henry finds evidence that the Order used the facility as a prison for the orphans, where they were frequently beaten and oftentimes died. Henry is able to free Andrew and later finds him speaking with the boy he previously saw at the orphanage. Andrew reveals that the boy is none other than Walter Sullivan. Andrew explains that he used to be a guard at this water prison, and that Walter was very much into the teachings of the Order. However, like the others, Henry eventually finds Andrew dead, with numbers carved into his corpse. Henry awakens yet again in his own apartment, reading more notes by Joseph Schreiber before returning through the hole, finding it now leads to an otherworld version of his own apartment complex, where he meets his real-life neighbor, Richard Braintree. Richard reveals that the tenant who lived in room 302 before Henry was Joseph Schreiber, who mysteriously disappeared after shutting himself into the apartment. Henry explores the other world complex while Richard finds the young Walter. He holds the boy at gunpoint, stating that the boy also lived in room 302 before Richard found him sneaking around. The boy runs and Richard gives chase. Henry eventually catches up with Richard, finding him in the other world version of his apartment, room 207, strapped to an electric chair with numbers carved into his forehead while the young Walter stands nearby. Henry wakes up in his apartment again and returns through the hole where he emerges in the other world hallway of his apartment. There, he sees the adult Walter Sullivan menacingly knocking on Eileen's door before walking off. Henry follows him and sees Walter's child version banging on the door to room 302. 
Eventually, Henry finds the adult Walter who tries to give him a doll that Eileen gave him when she was a child. Throughout the various rooms, Henry learns of the other inhabitants in the apartment complex, as well as their various relationships. A nurse named Rachel, the same nurse who treated Mary Sunderland, is stalked by her neighbor Mike, who was beaten up by Richard. There was also a painter who painted portraits of the various residents, including the building's superintendent, Frank Sunderland, none other than James's father. Oh my god! After finding various pieces of red paper and slipping them under his other world door, Henry returns back to his real world apartment and reads notes he slipped to himself. In the notes, Joseph Schreiber assembles all of his learnings about Walter Sullivan. Walter was born in room 302, but when his parents abandoned him there, he was found and sent to St. Jerome's Hospital. From there, he was adopted into the Wish House Orphanage, where he was indoctrinated into the order. Walter started to believe that room 302 was his mother, and he would return to the apartment and try to get in, being stopped by the new tenants. Disconnected from his perceived mother, Walter became obsessed with one of the cult's rituals, the 21 Sacraments, which he believed required 21 murders. Walter killed 10 victims, then conducted another ritual to kill himself as the 11th murder, but continued to live and murder through worlds of his own manifestation, allowing him to continue the 21 Sacraments. Henry returns to the other world and reaches Eileen's apartment, when he enters, he finds the woman bleeding to death on her floor with the numbers indicating she is the 20th victim carved in her back while the boy Walter stands above her. Henry falls to his knees and collapses. When Henry wakes back up in his apartment, he sees an ambulance taking Eileen to St. Jerome's Hospital. He also starts to notice various ways Walter's other world starts to invade his real world apartment, which he is able to ward off in various ways. Henry finds that the hole in his bathroom is now sealed shut, but he is able to open a new one in his laundry room, which he enters to reach the other world version of St. Jerome's Hospital. Henry sees Walter digging through a dead woman's abdomen, which causes him to leave the room. Henry finds Eileen's giant head eerily gazing in a hallway, but he then finds the real woman still alive, albeit very injured from her previous attack. Henry takes Eileen with him through a hole, but when he returns to his apartment, he finds himself alone. Henry re-enters the hole and finds Eileen in the hospital on the other side. She states that she doesn't see a hole, and Henry simply disappeared for a bit before reappearing. Henry tells Eileen about the last note he got from Joseph, which told him to go down into the deepest part of Walter to find the truth, and the pair head down a giant flight of stairs in Walter's other world. Henry and Eileen travel through the other worlds Henry has already visited, encountering each victim as a now dangerous ghost. Walter starts to stalk the pair, relentlessly attacking them to try to hinder their progress. In one of the other worlds, Henry watches the adult Walter kidnap his own younger self before running off. At the bottom of the giant stairwell, Henry and Eileen find Walter's other world version of room 302. There, the pair find the specter of Joseph Schreiber, who explains the ceremony of Holy Assumption, which allowed Walter to create the twisted other worlds that allow him to keep killing and finish his work, with Eileen and Henry being the final two victims. Henry learns that there was originally a storage room in his apartment that was sealed off. In the real world, Henry smashes through the new wall and enters the storage room, finding the body of Walter Sullivan strung up from the ceremony. Henry finds a set of keys in Walter's pocket and is able to use them to finally remove the locks from his door. With the door now open, Henry emerges into the hallway of his apartment to find that the other world has completely invaded. Eileen finds him, and the pair make their way to Frank Sunderland's room to find the umbilical cord from Walter's birth, which Frank had kept after the boy was born in room 302. Henry and Eileen split up, and when Henry returns to room 302, he finds Walter's body now gone, with a hole where it used to be. Henry enters the hole and finds Walter in a room with a spinning machine as well as a giant humanoid monster. Henry looks and sees Eileen, seemingly possessed, and walking towards the machine and her certain death. Walter attacks, and Harry uses the umbilical cord on the giant beast, allowing him to grab nearby spears and use them to pierce and damage the creature. With the beast incapacitated, Henry is able to attack Walter, finally defeating the serial killer for good. 
As Walter lays on the floor, he calls out to his mother before finally dying. Afterward, the room begins to collapse, and Eileen falls to her knees. Back outside room 302, child Walter stops knocking and disappears as the door opens. Later, Henry walks past the apartment outside, and he calls out for Eileen. The next day, Henry visits Eileen in the real-world hospital, bringing her a bouquet of flowers. Eileen then jokingly states that she'll have to find a new place to live, as the pair's nightmare finally comes to an end. In a different time, a former soldier named Jason decides to head to a mountain range to commit suicide, hoping to bring an end to his PTSD nightmares of his former unit dying in an attack. He crashes his car on the way to the mountainside he plans to do the act, and when he walks into the nearby town of Silent Hill, he's immediately met and attacked by monsters. Jason finds a shotgun and fights his way through the monsters, finding and saving a woman named Dahlia, a famous singer, who is then attacked again by a giant creature. She gets stabbed with a large cleaver, and Jason drags her away to safety, where she luckily survives her wound. However, they are soon ambushed by more creatures, and suddenly Jason's late friend and fellow soldier, Aaron, appears, much to his surprise, to protect the pair. The pair reach a building where the town's survivors are housed, and they take shelter until the next day, when they try to leave Silent Hill. They're soon stopped by monsters representing Jason's former unit. Jason and Dahlia take refuge in a nearby church, but they soon attack. Suddenly, Dahlia transforms into a monstrous figure herself and commands the other creatures to bow down and worship her. She then rips out her heart and gives it to Jason to ward away the monsters, before kicking him out of the window, allowing him to escape after speaking with Aaron. Later, Jason finds Dahlia at the mountaintop where he planned to do the deed. She states that Jason kept her heart, and it was a good thing since it saved them both. Jason then recounts his final conversation with Aaron, who reveals that the attack that killed their unit was planned, and Aaron was actually the one that should have survived to tell the tale. However, Aaron and the others felt Jason was the most deserving to survive, so they made that happen instead. Now realizing his survivor's guilt to be misplaced, Jason decides to live, as does Dahlia, and the pair walk away into the sunset. Some other time, a murderous, smiling madman blows up a building before hitching a ride to Silent Hill to deal with some unfinished business. Elsewhere, State Trooper Robert Tower arrives to work on his last day before retirement. Tower is shocked to learn that despite him choosing his own replacement, the department decided on another officer, Mayberry, to take his spot. Tower is to spend his last day showing Mayberry the ropes, and the pair are soon sent to Silent Hill on assignment. As the two get to talking, Tower learns that Mayberry is a believer in the supernatural rumors of Silent Hill, something that disgusts the superior officer. Meanwhile, the Grinning Man kills a few monsters, saving a pair of humans, who he states he has plans for. At the Lakeview Hotel, Mayberry begins to hear static on his radio, and he and Tower enter the building. Inside, two officers are dressed as monsters, planning to attack Mayberry as a bit of a prank on the newcomer. However, when the doors burst open, it's actually the Grinning Man who kills the two officers. When Tower and Mayberry enter, they spot apparitions of someone with long white hair, who quickly vanish, forcing the two to investigate the hotel where they find the two women the Grinning Man saved earlier. They have sigils burned into their foreheads, and the officers take them out of the hotel. Outside, Tower tries to question the women, but Mayberry theorizes that the incantation the Grinning Man placed on them must be preventing them from speaking. Just then, two other men who have the sigils on their foreheads arrive, claiming that they had, quote, died in the town ten years ago, and ask the officers to put them out of their misery, a request gladly accepted. Tower, now believing some of the stories he's heard, soon comes across the grinning man, and asks what his deal is. The man simply replies, I hunt. Tower meets this response with a gunshot, but it doesn't phase the grinning man. Monsters soon appear, and Tower tasks Mayberry with getting the girls to safety. Tower runs off and tries to rescue all of the others the Grinning Man kidnapped, but he later finds the man holding Mayberry hostage. Tower shoots the man and is able to actually wound him, having weakened his powers when he freed his kidnappees. As Tower continues to shoot the man, his own grin crosses his face, and the victim's burns leave their foreheads as the maniac bleeds out on the ground. Tower then gives one more look at the monsters he could never bring himself to believe in before, and opens fire at them as well. At some other point, an artist named Ike Isaacs is in a creative slump, leeching off his friend's generosity until he is kicked to the curb. On the street, 
Ike meets a stranger who warns him of Silent Hill, where his friend sacrificed his own life so the stranger could escape the town. With nowhere else to go, Ike decides to travel to the town to see if there's any validity to this story. When Ike reaches Silent Hill, he immediately falls in love, finding his artistic inspiration once again. When Ike finds the town's various monsters, he is allowed to safely paint portraits of them despite the creatures killing any other visitors. Six months later, Ike finds that his paintings are disappearing, but learns that they're somehow being sold to various art magazines and collectors. He tries to leave Silent Hill to confront his agent, but finds he's inexplicably unable to. A year into his stay in the town, Ike is met by a team of cheerleaders, led by their captain, Cheryl, whose bus broke down just outside of town. Feeling bad for them, Ike tries to protect the cheerleaders from the monsters, taking them in with him. When they overstay their welcome, he tries to get them to leave, but they lock him up. While he's sequestered, the cheerleaders are attacked and two are captured. Cheryl lets Ike out and they go to the bowling alley to try to save the kidnapped girls. The cheerleaders use found weapons to fight the monsters, and Ike scurries off, and finds that he can enter his own paintings, or at least ones with his name on them that he doesn't remember painting, to travel to some kind of other dimension. Ike pulls Cheryl into the painting world, but monsters follow. They fight them off and soon find the kidnapped cheerleaders, being held by a monster in a ghastly mask. Cheryl tries to attack, but the creature overpowers her. Ike then stops the monster by threatening to stop painting if they continue killing all of the town's visitors. This angers the monsters, who lift their protection of Ike and begin to attack the four of them. They run, and the girls exit the painting world, closing the portal behind them by destroying the painting, trapping the monsters, as well as Ike, inside. The cheerleaders then leave Silent Hill, but the two kidnappees hide monstrous forms from Cheryl. Some other time, Silent Hill Gazette reporter Douglas Brenneman finds himself in a nightmare of the town abandoned, with a heavy fog and various monsters attacking him. He awakens and tells his fiancée, Rosie, about it, but she simply writes it off as daydreaming. While on a story, Douglas and his editor chase an ambulance to an abandoned house, where the current sheriff of the town, Bryce Canavan, reveals that one of his officers was murdered inside after being led there by a fake 911 call. Meanwhile, a strange man with long white hair in a suit silently watches on. Douglas ignores him and sees this cop killer as his next big scoop, so he gets to work. Back at the newsroom, Douglas receives a package from an unnamed sender, containing the journal of an eight-year-old child. Inside, there's drawings of several monsters, and Douglas then envisions the journal sprouting tendrils and attacking him. Douglas snaps too and tries to piece everything together, finding the phrase, they are hungry, multiple times. Douglas goes to the home in the return address of the package and finds an old woman named Clara, who recognizes the handwriting on the label and tells him it's from a man known only as Waitley, who she describes as the man with the white hair Douglas had seen earlier. Clara explains that Waitley had been renting a room from her and she would smell strange aromas from this room, and once saw him watching a man play doctor with a young woman. Douglas asks around town and only hears strange stories of odd behavior and everyone suffering from an insatiable hunger. Douglas sees Rosie and follows her, but after she heads underground, he is attacked by a seemingly homeless man who rambles about the Order, planning to summon an entity called Samael. Douglas is rescued by Waitley, who brutally kills the attacker. Waitley tells Douglas that he has a part to play in the upcoming events, but doesn't elaborate before he walks off. Afterwards, Douglas starts to feel the hunger himself, but he is able to overcome it and get back to work on his story. As he returns to his office, however, the sky turns gray and a heavy fog rolls into the town. He tries to contact Rosie, but finds that she's gone missing. He soon gets a hold of her, but finds that he's actually listening to the 911 call that led the officers to the abandoned house. Douglas runs to the house and finds Sheriff Canavan, holding Waitley at gunpoint. Waitley shows Douglas a vision of what the murdered officer saw in his final moments, Rosie being held as a sacrifice. Suddenly a tentacle shoots out of Waitley's mouth and he kills the sheriff. Waitley explains that he killed the sheriff as a warning, and if he fulfills his role, Douglas's hunger will forever be satiated. Douglas takes the sheriff's gun and runs off to find Rosie, finding the citizens of Silent Hill to be acting more and more violently as monsters begin to descend from the sky, which kill Douglas's editor. Douglas sees Rosie once again and follows her into a library, where he speaks with her but finds that she doesn't recognize him at all. 
She points him to a file, written by Dr. Aikman, which details experiments he had been running on fertile young women to try to find one to carry a child for some reason. Rosie then transforms into a monster, and Douglas realizes it's just another one of Waitley's lies. She knocks him down, and he finds a book called The Book of Samael, A History of Silent Hill, written by him, although he's never written a book in his life. Douglas runs from the monster and reaches Brookhaven Hospital, where he finds Aikman's office. The doctor reveals that he had been trying to find a young woman who could birth the Order's god, Samael. As Douglas threatens the doctor, Waitley arrives and takes his gun and teleports him out of the hospital. Douglas looks around and views a fiery, hellish landscape of the town, and Waitley offers Douglas a life as Samael's servant, with the mission to tell the story of this night in The Book of Samael. His other option is to stay in this hellish version of Silent Hill for eternity with his love, Rosie, who appears before him. Douglas decides to fulfill his hunger for the truth behind the other world, as well as his desire to stay with Rosie. To do this, he realizes he must die and be reborn, so he lets the demonic Rosie rip out his throat, satiating her own hunger in the process. At some other point in time, we find famed psychiatrist Troy Abernathy no longer taking patients after his wife, Juliana, committed suicide. One day, his colleague Phil comes to him with a patient named Lynn DeAngelis, who he finally agrees to treat. Lynn, a film student, suffered some apparent trauma when she visited Silent Hill on a video shoot. After a year of treatment, she has seen no progress, and as Troy takes over, he also notices that none of his methods work on the girl. As a bit of a radical treatment, Troy takes Lynn back to Silent Hill to let her face what happened to her there. As Troy helps Lynn out of his car, he is soon shocked to find a bloody gurney on the foggy street, and nearby is a nurse, bleeding profusely from her neck, where a scalpel is sticking out. The nurse stands up, and Troy realizes it's none other than his dead wife. Troy tries to run away, but is attacked by monstrous dog-like creatures. He is able to find a nearby piece of metal and fights them off, regrouping with Lynn, who has also seen the nurse. Troy refuses to believe what he has seen, but his guilt begins to overwhelm him, as he blames something he did for driving his wife to suicide. More monsters appear, and Troy grabs Lynn to run back to his car, only to find the tires slashed. They run to safety in a nearby building, and inside they find a young girl in a white dress, one that Lynn had seen in a dream about Silent Hill who introduces herself as Christabella. Christabella spots Lynn and yells at her that she brought the wrong one before unleashing a monster to punish her. Lynn simply ignores the monster, which slightly annoys Christabella, who states that they let Lynn get footage of Silent Hill and allowed her to leave so that she would bring others back to the town, but she never uploaded the footage to the internet and only brought Troy, who she isn't very impressed with. As Christabella goes to finally kill Lynn, a man with a gun shows up one that Lynn had also seen in her dream, and Troy recognizes him as a man named Brett, who shouldn't be alive. Brett throws a gun that Lynn grabs, and she shoots Christabella in the eye, who simply walks away annoyed. The three leave the building, and Lynn notices the back of Brett's skull is bashed and bloody. Brett states that he and Troy go way back, and Troy pushes him out of the way before grabbing Lynn and running off. The pair fight through some monsters before finding another place to take shelter, where they find Juliana once again. She takes the scalpel out of her neck and attacks Troy with it, forcing Lynn to bash her across the skull to knock her off of him. As Troy and Lynn turn to leave, Juliana reveals that the wound on the back of Brett's head was from Troy, who had murdered the man. After they leave, Troy tries to explain that Brett was a monster that deserved to die, and Lynn surmises that Juliana must have killed herself when she found out that Troy was just as much of a monster. The pair are then chased by more actual monsters before finding a bridge out of town but they are stopped by Christabella and a monstrous manifestation of Brett. They try to fight the monsters off, but are unsuccessful, prompting Troy to offer himself up in exchange for Lynn's freedom, and Christabella takes the offer, killing Troy and allowing Lynn to cross the bridge. As she reaches the other side, a couple in a car pick her up and drive her away from Silent Hill. Later, Christabella reveals that she had been recording Troy's death, and later a group of young adults watch the tape. One of them, called Clown, reveals that he took the tape from Lynn when she was at the hospital a year prior, but that the contents of it have changed since he originally watched it. Seeing something of interest, Clown's girlfriend Lauren states that they need to go to Silent Hill themselves. The group arrives in Silent Hill with a camcorder, and Lauren reveals that she saw symbols on the tape that matched a tome she read containing evocations to raise spirits, or even gods. 
She states that there were six demons' names written on the walls in the video, and she figures the rest of the graffiti in town must contain the rest of this riddle. Soon after, however, a fight breaks out amongst the group, and the man who initiated the fight walks off in anger. He is then killed by Christabella, and Lauren suddenly finds herself in a dark room. There, she is confronted by a man holding a file of her darkest secrets, including feeling responsible for her younger sister's murder, before tendrils sprout from his chest and he begins to envelop her. She then awakens inside a mall, where a boy called Payne, her boyfriend's brother, grabs her and kisses her, asking if she's ever going to tell Clown about their relationship, one she retorts isn't serious. The group is then attacked by monsters, and they fight them off while Lauren tries to use a spell from the book, which she is unable to do before she is captured and taken away by one of the creatures. The rest of the group are able to ignite the remaining monsters to escape, but they are stopped by Christabella, but as she speaks to the group, she is smacked over the head. As she turns, she sees Lauren, who had escaped from the creatures with the book. Christabella then greets the woman, calling her Big Sis, revealing that the young girl is a nightmare manifestation of her murdered sibling. Lauren begins to recite an evocation, causing Christabella to burst into flame before she dies before her sister's eyes. Or at least she pretends to. The girl reveals her ruse and states that she's had a lot of time to hone her powers, causing Lauren and her friends to run away, despite her sister laughing at their attempt to flee. Elsewhere, another group of Lauren's friends fight another monster of Christabella's creation, and they're able to successfully defeat it. As they recuperate, however, what remains of Troy Abernathy appears, with tendrils protruding from his chest. Troy apologizes as he doesn't want to do what he's about to do, but he is forced to in his current, quote, position. He then kills each member of the group. Meanwhile, Lauren's group escapes Christabella. They find some guns at a sporting goods store, and Payne whispers to Lauren that Clown may know about their affair. She then tries to call the other group, but Troy answers the phone instead. Troy tells her about two more groups of her friends that are in danger, one at the lighthouse and one at Midwich Elementary School. Then he forces her to relive the day when she allowed her sister to go with a pair of boys who were secretly being used by child abductors, who murdered Christabella and the boys not long after. Lauren is able to escape the vision with the help of her friends, and they split up to go to the lighthouse and the school to save the rest of their friends. As Clown, Payne, and Lauren drive off, they're attacked by a monster, and Lauren is forced to drive the car off the road into a tree. They survive the crash, but the brothers are left unconscious. Christabella then appears to speak with Lauren, and Lauren grabs the book once again, but her sister is unaffected, knowing that the last time she tried to use it, nothing happened. Lauren then reveals that she had used the book to, quote, mark her friends, and now that they've been killed, she's able to bring them back from the dead to fight fire with fire. While her zombies begin to fight the monsters, the brothers regain consciousness in the car. However, they are soon swarmed by another group of monsters. Lauren tries to force Christabella to call them off, but she simply states that she can't, as they don't belong to her. While Lauren tries to get her zombies to protect the car, Christabella won't let them past her monsters unless Lauren agrees to do what she wants. Lauren reluctantly agrees, and Christabella's monsters protect the brothers. Christabella then reveals that she brought Lauren to Silent Hill as part of a plan to help her gain control of the town, as she is now in the middle of a power struggle. Meanwhile, at the lighthouse, one of the friends, Hogg, is met by Troy Abernathy, who stands over the corpses of the dead friends that were there. While Troy states that he had nothing to do with their deaths, he does have other plans for Hogg. Lauren is sent to the Brookhaven Hospital, and she tries to find who Christabella had been fighting with. While she explores, her undead friends tell her how much they enjoy their current state. However, they are soon all ignited into flame, and a man emerges from the carnage. Waitley the very person she's looking for. Meanwhile, in the car wreck, Payne tries to tell his brother about his affair with his girlfriend, but Clown stops him, stating that he already knows. Christabella then rips the roof off the car and asks them to be her new friends, as Troy isn't answering him, and she needs to teach him a lesson to not cross her. Back in the hospital, Waitley blames Lauren for bringing Christabella's evil to Silent Hill. Lauren tries to use the book, but Waitley simply lights it aflame with his powers. Just as Waitley threatens to kill Lauren, Hogg and Troy arrive, and Troy reveals that Waitley serves the order before Hogg shoots him with a shotgun. A monster emerges from Waitley's body, and his army of creatures begin to attack. As they begin to fight them off, Troy asks Lauren to open a nearby door and find the sleeping patient inside the room. He states that she is the source of all of the darkness in Silent Hill, and awaking her will bring it to an end. Lauren opens the door, but as she's about to enter, Christabella stops her 
threatening to kill her boyfriends if she doesn't help her regain control over Troy to kill the patient so she can take full control over Silent Hill. Lauren realizes that the power to make things right exists within her, and she's able to banish all of the monsters, as well as her own thralls. She's then able to limit her sister's powers before leaving her with Troy to treat her. On the outskirts of Silent Hill, Payne and Clown find Lauren and ask her to go home with them. She simply states that she is home, before stating that she plans to stay there with Hog. The brothers then reluctantly walk out of the town as Lauren walks back in. Inside, Lauren notices the fog beginning to lift, and she lifts her arms into the air and claims that it's going to be a beautiful day. At some later point, we once again find Christabella and Troy Abernathy in Silent Hill, preparing to head somewhere in a car. Meanwhile, a woman named Connie Mills speaks in a store with an acquaintance about her former relationship with famed actor Kenneth Carter. However, the store begins to transform into an other world that only Connie can see, where she is grabbed by a monster and disappears, leaving only the words Silent Hill scratched into the ground. Back in Silent Hill, Christabella grows annoyed with the changes Lauren made to the town, making it more safe and boring. She goes to sleep, but when she wakes up, she finds the town back in its hellish, monstrous form. Christabella tries to go to Lauren's room to get her sister's book, but finds the door chain shut in a very familiar way. Christabella finds a monster and tries to get it to help her tear down the door, but instead of following her commands, the monster instead bites her hand, and she starts to bleed, making her realize that she is somehow alive once more. In Los Angeles, Kenneth Carter watches a screening of his new movie in his home with his girlfriend Jessica Aldrich and his dog Bear. He takes a call with John Cross, a private investigator, and tasks him with finding out who his parents are, no matter the cost. Cross then informs him of Connie's disappearance, and he hangs up. Kenneth tells Jessica about Connie, and she grows extremely jealous, so jealous that her face opens up and she transforms into a monstrous creature. Meanwhile, in Silent Hill, Christabella tries to hide from the monsters in the antique shop, but instead finds a creature representing the Order, who is upset at Lauren's meddling. While the creature threatens to kill Christabella, the girl states that they're working for the same thing, and offers a deal. Back in Kenneth's house, the actor runs into his bathroom, and watches his reflection mutate before the room transforms into the other world, and as a monster appears, he is forced to fight it. Kenneth's paintings, by Ike Isaacs, then transform into portals to the other dimension, and Bear jumps through one. Before Kenneth can chase him inside, a woman named Lenora appears before him and offers to help him find Connie in exchange for him playing his part in Something New That's Coming. Another monster then appears and drags Kenneth away to Silent Hill. When Kenneth awakens in the town, he begins to look for Connie, but is soon met by Christabella, who tricks him with her childish demeanor obviously with something else in mind for the man. Meanwhile, Bear arrives in Silent Hill and somehow befriends the monsters. Kenneth and Christabella explore the town and reach an abandoned movie theater. Inside, Kenneth is surprised to find his own birth certificate, listing his real name, Joshua Reynolds, as well as several other documents regarding his past. He can't investigate too much, as they're soon met by monsters, causing them to flee to an auditorium. There, the pair take a seat and watch the movie that's showing. The film depicts Kenneth promoting the town of Silent Hill, and ends with a video of Connie. In the video, Connie tells Kenneth that he must stop, quote, wearing someone else's skin and be true to himself, before showing him that in his house in the real world, his new girlfriend Jessica has been murdered by an axe to the skull, with a note written in her blood putting the blame on Kenneth. Connie then tries to force Kenneth to admit he committed the murder, but he continues to deny it, and this Connie is revealed to be Lenora in disguise. Just then, Troy Abernathy enters the theater, deformed and monstrous, who states that he is there to make Christabella pay for what she's done, threatening Kenneth as well. Troy explains the twisted world of Silent Hill to Kenneth, and Christabella reveals her powers, stopping Troy with some kind of attack that causes her to pass out. Despite Lenora's warning, Kenneth carries Christabella out of the theater and tries to get to safety, but he is attacked by several monsters. As he becomes surrounded, he is surprised to see Ike Isaacs arrive with a gun to protect him, and with his trusty canine companion, Bear. Christabella wakes up and helps Kenneth and Ike fight off the creatures. Meanwhile, back in the real world, Jessica Aldrich's body is examined, and her autopsy reveals that the axe wound in her head wasn't the cause of her death, rather, it was placed there post-mortem. Her actual cause of death was something unexplainable eating her. Somewhere in Silent Hill, Connie awakens in a tub being worked on by two monstrous nurses. She looks before her to spot Lenora, who speaks with the woman. 
Connie tries to respond, but finds that she can't speak. Lenora reveals that since a single word from her lips can quote, save Kenneth's soul, she's taken away her voice. She then states that Connie is an empty vessel, but one that will be filled soon. Elsewhere in the town, Ike speaks with Kenneth and Christabella, and the girl reveals that like Troy, Ike is now dead, and simply serves her sister Lauren. Ike doesn't believe this, and states that he was sent to help take Kenneth to something that he'll need, but he doesn't know what it is. The group see lights in the distance, and head there to find a festival the monsters are holding for Lenora. Ike finds the item he was tasked with locating, a large mystical blade that can take souls. When Christabella causes Ike to accidentally cut himself with it, the monsters from the festival smell his blood and begin to attack. Kenneth grabs Ike's gun and begins to slay them, transforming into the murderer Lenora wanted him to be. Kenneth is then wounded, and his attacker is revealed to be Lenora, who teases that his parents may have some kind of connection to Silent Hill, before showing him the real world once again, where he has supposedly murdered the investigator and coroner looking into Jessica's murder. Lenora takes Kenneth to where she is keeping Connie, and explains the part she wants Kenneth to play, being the other world's emissary and spokesperson in the real world. She then gives Kenneth a choice to kill either Connie, Bear, or Christabella by midnight, or else they will all die. What she doesn't know, however, is that Christabella is holding the blade. Christabella throws the dagger at Lenora, and it impales her chest. The clock then stops at one minute to midnight. Before Christabella can celebrate, Lenora pulls the dagger from her chest and reveals that since she has no soul, the blade has no power on her. Christabella then runs off, and Bear follows her, leaving Connie to be Kenneth's only choice. He then picks up a nearby axe and swings it towards Connie, slashing her chains, and allowing her to escape as he flees as well. Back in the real world, a woman is being interviewed by a man with a company called WTM Media about a murder she witnessed, which she reveals was committed by none other than famous actor Kenneth Carter. The company is planning to buy exclusive rights to her story, and she tells it to the man who introduces himself by a single name, Waitley. Meanwhile in Silent Hill, Lenora finds Bear, but the dog is able to snatch the dagger from her and run off. Kenneth looks for Connie, Bear, and Christabella, and he finds Lauren's house. As he prepares to enter, he is stopped by his victims in the real world, Jessica and the police investigator, but he ignores them, chopping the chains to Lauren's room. As he enters, he finds her book, but is more shocked to find the ghastly figure of his own father. Elsewhere, Christabella is tricked by Troy Abernathy, who lures her into a jazz club to enact his revenge on her. He is stopped from doing so by a seemingly possessed Connie, who simply states the empty vessel has been filled. Lenora is then found by Waitley, and it is revealed that she serves the man. She states that she'll do anything for him and their cause, but he reveals that he knows the truth, that Lenora is none other than Lauren LaRoche in disguise. In the jazz club, the being that possessed Connie absorbs Troy's soul, and Christabella tries to fight, but uses her abilities to teleport away. She then travels to Bear's location and takes the dagger from him. Meanwhile, Kenneth speaks with his father, who reveals that he and his wife conceived Kenneth with the sole intention of having him become famous so he could spread the word of Silent Hill and bring more and more people into the nightmare. Kenneth's mother, a monster in disguise, planned the whole thing, seducing a human, his father, in order to have a half-human child that could live in the real world. His father then states that it's up to him whether he wants to live up to their plan or not. Elsewhere, Waitley and Lauren battle, and just as Waitley gets the upper hand, Kenneth arrives and presses the book up against the man's head, burning him. Meanwhile, Christabella stabs Connie with the dagger, and she transforms into a massive creature, one assumed to be the incarnation of a god, Samael, which then arrives at the battle. Lauren fights the creature inhabiting Connie, and Kenneth is forced to use his axe to finish her. However, as he plants the axe in her skull, an explosion occurs, and Kenneth is startled awake inside a bed. In it, he's shocked to find Connie, still alive and well, next to him. Kenneth finds himself in some kind of paradise, where he was never an actor and instead he lives on a farm with Connie and Bear. Elsewhere, Lauren lives with Ike in France, and the pair watch the news to see Waitley arrested for the murders. Meanwhile, Christabella remains in Silent Hill, and retakes her place as its ruler at least in her own reality. At some other point in time, former hitman Jack Stanton and his girlfriend Jill Conway are traveling by car when they make a pit stop just outside Silent Hill. 
They stop at Karen's Barbecue, and Jill uses the restroom. And as Jack watches her walk off, he reflects on their relationship. As it turns out, Jill is Jack's boss's wife, and the pair ran off together to start a new life after they fell in love, which gave Jack the inspiration to try to be more than just a hitman. Jack walks into the nearby pump station and pays for some gas, but as he walks out, he's met with a pistol to the face, held by Dewey O'Connor, while his brother Liam and another associate, Jimmy Shea, surround him. Dewey tells Jack that they were sent by their boss, Finn Conway, to retrieve his wife, Jill. Dewey grabs Jill and Liam pistol whips Jack. Suddenly, a shotgun blast rings out, and the O'Connor brothers are blown away by the emerging pump station attendant. Jimmy throws Jill in his car and speeds off, while Jack can only watch as he slips into unconsciousness. While out, Jack dreams of his childhood with his father, who was also a hitman. Jack's dad taught him how to use a firearm and forced him to shoot his own beloved pet dog to train him how to kill. When Jack awakens, the old attendant is dealing with the bodies, and he tells Jack that Jimmy drove up to Silent Hill. Jack gets in his car and speeds off to the town, and he finds Jimmy's vehicle quicker than expected. However, he also spots the man dead on the ground, with two dog-like monsters consuming his corpse. Jack gets out to investigate, but finds Jimmy's car empty. He then looks over to find Jimmy somehow standing up, and the undead man speaks to him, stating that Jill is waiting for him in Silent Hill. As the man transforms into a more monstrous form, Jack is forced to pull his gun and shoot him, before getting back into his car and driving into the town. Once he reaches Silent Hill, Jack runs out of gas and exits his car to find the foggy town completely empty, and he grabs some weapons from his trunk before beginning his search for Jill. In Boston, Finn Conway sits at his bar, concerned that he hasn't been able to get a hold of the men he sent to retrieve his wife. He then decides that if he wants something done right, he has to do it himself, and heads off to handle the situation. Back in Silent Hill, Jack finds Jill's bloodstained dress outside of Pete's Bolorama. As he goes to investigate, a giant monster emerges and attacks, and he's forced to fight it. Suddenly, Jill emerges from the bowling alley dressed as a nurse and scolds Jack for hurting the creature, not seeing it as a monster. She then says that the town is of their creation, and all of their victims are there waiting for them. He tries to console her, but she runs off frantically, leaving Jack with the creature who awakens and attacks once again. Jack sees the creature's face and recognizes it as that of Tim Delaney, a man he killed for Finn a decade prior. He kills the man again and runs off after Jill, but instead finds another woman tied up to a crucifix, surrounded by monsters. Jack sees the faces of other people he killed on the monsters, and he kills them to protect the woman before cutting her down from the cross. The girl introduces herself as Sarah and explains that she was with her parents before a siren rang out. Then she found herself tied up somehow. He tries to give her a gun to protect herself, but she refuses, stating that she hates guns and won't use one. Meanwhile, Finn Conway arrives at the pump station outside the town and asks the attendant if he had seen his men roll through. The old man lies and denies ever seeing them, but when he's threatened with a gun, he does state that Jack and Jill came through looking for a place to eat, and he sent them to Silent Hill. In the town, Jack and Sarah come across Brookhaven Hospital, and Jack decides to investigate, given that Jill was wearing a nurse's uniform. When they enter, Jack hears screaming upstairs and rushes up, finding a room filled with dead monsters on gurneys, with Jill looking over them. Outside, Finn finds Jack's car and follows his footsteps. In the hospital, Jill is hysterical over not being able to save the monsters. Jack tries to calm her down when Sarah enters and reveals that she also sees the dead monsters as people. Sarah pulls back one of the covers and finds a pair of corpses, her own parents. Sarah then realizes that the bodies in the room are the people Jack has killed, and accuses him of killing her parents. Before he can respond to her, however, a loud siren blares, causing Jack and Jill to fall to the floor. Jack then remembers the night of Sarah's parents' death. His final hit job for Finn was to kill Councilman Linwood. While Jack was able to kill him and his wife in their sleep, as he went to escape, he was spotted by Sarah, and he shot her in the head, killing the girl. When Jack looks up, he finds Sarah now standing before him with a team of monstrous nurses, preparing to get payback for what he's done. Sarah confronts Jack about killing her family and mocks him for never having one of his own. Sarah states that both Jack and Jill have a disease, murder and greed, respectively. She states that they can make things right by curing their disease. 
Jill says her goodbyes to Jack and tells Sarah to cure her, resulting in the girl and her nurses stabbing her to death as Jack watches on, powerless to help. Sarah then gives Jack a chance to cure himself, but he instead chooses to run, finding her waiting for him at every turn. Outside the hospital, Jack is met by Finn, who holds a revolver to his head. Jack reveals to Finn that his wife is dead, and Sarah then commands a pyramid head to kill the man so he won't kill Jack first. Jack tries to run out of town, but finds his childhood dog, the one he was forced to kill, and his guilt rushes over him. Jack falls to his knees, and Sarah appears before him. He tries to apologize to the girl, but she tells him it's too late. He then realizes what he must do as he puts the gun to his own head. He then finishes his last hit job, this time on himself, and Sarah disappears, leaving the dead man as the fog lifts in Silent Hill. Sometime later, we find prisoner Murphy Pendleton in the Ryle State Prison, where he is led by a corrupt corrections officer named George Sewell to the showers. In the showers, Murphy turns on all the water lines to steam up the security cameras before a man named Patrick Napier enters. Napier is surprised to see Murphy, as he is supposed to be sequestered. Murphy then tells Napier that they used to be neighbors before he grabs a weapon left for him and savagely assaults Napier. As he goes to deliver the final blow, we see Murphy wake up in his cell, waking from a dream in which he is reliving the event. Sewell is waiting at his cell door, and he cuffs the prisoner as he escorts him to be transferred to the Wayside Maximum Security Penitentiary. Murphy gets on the transport bus with a few other prisoners, as well as Officer Anne Marie Cunningham. As the bus passes by Silent Hill, Murphy dozes off and dreams of his son, Charlie, who died. When the driver gets distracted by an unruly prisoner, he looks back to see that the road comes to a sudden drop, and he turns to avoid it, causing the bus to careen off the side of the road and flip down a hill. Murphy survives the crash and awakens in the woods, where he makes a break for escape. As he tries to climb up a rocky wall, however, he is held at gunpoint by an arriving Cunningham, who crosses a narrow ledge to reach him. Cunningham loses her footing, and Murphy can try to help her, but either way, she falls into the abyss below, leaving Murphy able to continue on. As Murphy reaches Silent Hill, he is met by Silent Hill's seemingly eternal postman, Howard Blackwood. Howard offers Murphy his help to leave the town, but as they speak, Murphy spots a creature in a wheelchair observing the conversation from a nearby window. When he turns back, however, the creature is gone, and the window is boarded up. Howard ignores Murphy's paranoia and tells him he can probably leave the town via the nearby Sky Tram before he mysteriously vanishes to continue delivering his mail. As Murphy passes through the kitchen of a nearby diner, he tries to stop a gas leak. This goes awry, however, and a fire breaks out, forcing Murphy to pull the fire alarm and activate the sprinkler system. As the kitchen fills with water, the walls and ceiling begin to crack away, transforming the diner and taking Murphy on his first trip to the other world. As he tries to escape, he comes across the Void, a black hole-like vortex that begins to absorb everything around it, forcing Murphy to run through a horrible game mechanic to escape as it follows. Eventually, Murphy escapes the Void and returns to Foggy Silent Hill where he exits the diner and explores an adjacent building where he finds a fellow escapee named Sanchez, seemingly beating a woman to death. When Murphy stops him, however, the woman is revealed to be an otherworldly monster, which slashes Sanchez's throat, killing him instantly. Murphy fights off the creature and continues his search, finding a change of clothes, and in the pockets, he finds a police badge adorned with a mourning band. Murphy then reaches the Sky Tram and rides it across the Devil's Pit Gorge to emerge on an observation deck. There, Murphy meets a depressed former tour guide named J.P. Slater, who states that there's a train through a nearby cavern that can take him to the hillside area of the town. Passing through the caverns, Murphy comes across J.P. once again, now contemplating jumping off of a lookout deck. J.P. was accused of causing a train crash that killed eight children due to his drinking, and Murphy can either console or chastise him. Either way, J.P. jumps off the ledge into the gorge and his certain death. Murphy finds the train and is able to get it operational again, but the other world begins to invade his trip and monsters begin to attack, causing his car to derail and he loses consciousness. When Murphy awakens, he finds himself at the exit of the train ride, 
but as he goes to leave, he is stopped by Cunningham, who survived her fall. She starts to place him under arrest and searches his person, finding the badge, which takes her by surprise. She demands to know where he got this badge, but Murphy states his ignorance of everything going on. Cunningham considers killing Murphy, stating that he doesn't deserve to live, but can't bring herself to do it, and collapses in a fit of emotional rage as she demands Murphy leave her alone, a request he complies with. Murphy explores the hillside area until it begins to rain, when he then takes shelter in an abandoned apartment building. Inside, he hears a radio broadcast from a DJ named Bobby Ricks, which features requests addressed directly to Murphy. As Murphy leaves the complex, he runs into Howard again, and he gives Murphy directions to the radio station. When Murphy gets to the station building, he finds his parole papers tacked to the door, triggering a memory of the prison. In the memory, Murphy is speaking to Sewell about some kind of offer before Officer Frank Coleridge calls Murphy over to hand him his paperwork. Coleridge warns Murphy not to work with Sewell as he's bad news, and he instead encourages Murphy to keep up his good behavior before going up before the parole board. The pair then discuss why Murphy even ended up in prison. Frank is confused as to why someone with no prior criminal record would break the law, stealing a police cruiser, and end up locked up working with a corrupt officer. He then gives Murphy one more word of encouragement to stay on the straight and narrow before leaving him in his cell. As Murphy ascends the building to reach the radio station, he has another memory of a conversation with Sewell, where it is revealed that Murphy got himself arrested on purpose so he could be in the same jail as Patrick Napier, the man he attacked in the showers. It turns out, this opportunity for an ambush was set up by Sewell in exchange for a favor Murphy would owe him in the future. Murphy finally reaches the DJ and asks him what the dedications mean. DJ Bobby Ricks initially acts like there's nothing amiss, and he has no idea what Murphy's referring to, but then lowers his voice and expresses his joy that someone finally heard his cries for help. He then tells Murphy about a boat at the marina that they can use to escape the town, but Murphy needs to find the keys. Suddenly, Cunningham bursts in with her gun drawn and tries to use Rick's phone, but the three are attacked by monsters. The lights cut, and when they turn back on, Murphy is back in the other world, now alone. Murphy is again forced to run from the void, and when his surroundings transform into the prison-like area, he is once again observed by the wheelchair-bound creature, the Wheelman, before he falls from the building and finds himself hanging from the clock tower before he falls. Murphy then awakens on a bench back in Silent Hill, where Howard comes across him once again. Howard hands him a letter from St. Maria's Monastery and expresses that Murphy should go there. Murphy heads to the monastery and speaks with a nun, who tells him that someone had died, and Murphy was the only family they could find. She then asks him to meet her in the morgue when he is ready. Murphy is confused to find the monastery nearly destroyed, and he's forced to fight through various monsters to find his way to the morgue. On the way, he is blocked by a locked door with a young boy on the other end, who refuses to let Murphy in as he believes him to be the boogeyman. The only way the boy will let Murphy prove his safety is by reciting a poem the children in the orphanage repeat to keep the boogeyman away. Murphy travels through the monastery, finding various pieces of paper with parts of the poem written on them. As he collects these pieces, he finds himself remembering more events from his past, namely surrounding his son Charlie's death, in which he was drowned by a child abductor, one who was later believed to be Patrick Napier, revealing Murphy's desire to kill the man in prison. Murphy returns to the boy and recites the poem, but he simply ignores him. Just then, the real boogeyman appears and kills the boy. As Murphy watches the boogeyman suffocate the boy, he realizes the child is a manifestation of his own son, and he realizes that once again, he is helpless to save him. The boogeyman leaves and the door opens, allowing Murphy to rush over and mourn the boy. Just then, a girl spots him and accuses him of hurting the boy before running off. Not wanting another child to be harmed, he chases after her, but the monastery begins to transform into its otherworldly counterpart. Murphy runs from the void, as well as the boogeyman, and reaches the little girl, holding hands with the wheelman. As Murphy approaches, the floor falls beneath him, and he awakens in the foggy reality version of the morgue, where he meets the nun. The nun removes a sheet to reveal the corpse to be the boogeyman asking him to sign for his, quote, son's body. 
A confused Murphy breaks down, admitting that what he did to Napier didn't actually change anything. Murphy takes a key from a necklace on the boogeyman, and the figure grabs him before swinging his massive hammer, teleporting Murphy to the lake where his son drowned. The boogeyman emerges from the water, and the two battle, with Murphy gaining the upper hand and using the monster's own hammer to defeat him. Murphy finds himself back in the morgue, and he approaches the body, finding its face to be oscillating between his own and Napier's. A manifestation of Charlie appears and congratulates Murphy on killing the boogeyman, but Murphy concedes that it ultimately meant nothing, as it couldn't bring his son back. He then takes the key and finds that it has the word freedom written on it. Murphy reaches the marina and boards Rick's boat, using the key to start the engine. Murphy then smiles as he drives the boat into the sunrise. The fog over the town begins to lift, and the nightmare appears to be over. Until Cunningham pulls her gun and presses on the back of his neck, bringing the fog and Murphy's dread back to its former state. Cunningham demands Murphy turn the boat around and return to the town. She states that the town has shown her things, and that they have to complete their unfinished business before the town will let them leave. Murphy refuses, stating that she might as well shoot him, which causes her to pull the trigger. In another flashback, we see the moment Sewell asked Murphy to repay his favor. Murphy's job is to kill someone in the showers during a riot. While Sewell doesn't explain why he wants the man dead, he does state that he, quote, deserves it. Just then, Murphy wakes up inside his prison cell with the wheel man sitting outside. After the creature leaves, his cell door opens and Murphy makes his way to the showers. There, Murphy finds the crime scene evidence of a murder, and he eventually finds a body bag on the ground of the showers. Murphy examines the body and it disappears, transforming the prison into the other world with it. Murphy runs from the void, fights a gauntlet of enemies, and faces rooms of death traps that he must navigate. Murphy finds a room with the scales of justice, and he puts the evidence from the shower on the scale. A pair of doors open, and Murphy goes through them to find a giant version of the wheelman, which begins to attack him. Murphy is then forced to navigate the cell block area to climb various watchtowers and pull the wheelman's life support tubes, eventually killing the giant creature. Murphy finds himself back in the shower, standing over the corpse of the wheelman. Cunningham appears and holds him at gunpoint yet again, but Murphy states that he acted in self-defense, pointing at the creature's body to prove it. When he looks over, however, he sees that the corpse on the shower is actually Frank Coleridge, the friendly officer who only ever tried to help him. In another flashback, we learn that when Murphy went to the showers to repay his favor to Sewell, he was shocked and saddened to learn his target was Frank. Sewell arrives and reveals that Murphy is going to kill him to prevent him from snitching on Sewell's illegal conduct. Sewell then demands Murphy kill Frank, while Coleridge simply pleads for him not to. In present time, Anne tells Murphy that Frank Coleridge was her father, and the reason she became a police officer. She reveals that when Frank was attacked, he didn't die, but was left in a vegetative state bound to a wheelchair. She then begins to see Murphy as the boogeyman and reveals that she pulled the strings to get him transferred to the prison she worked at so she could enact her revenge. She then shoots Murphy and he awakens as the boogeyman and attacks her. After the boogeyman incapacitates Cunningham, Murphy is given the choice to either kill or spare her. He ultimately chooses to spare her and we learn that it was Sewell who actually beat Frank to his near death before pinning it on Murphy. Back in the fog world, Anne realizes that Murphy was innocent in her father's death, and the pair share a hug, after which they find themselves back in the real world after the bus crash. Cunningham hears a call on her radio about the location of Murphy Pendleton, and she simply responds that he's dead. Murphy asks her if she'll be okay, and she simply tells him that he'd better go before the reinforcements arrive. Back at the prison, Anne meets Sewell in his office. She hands him her father's badge and states that the two need to talk. While she holds a gun behind her back, remembering that while her father didn't believe in revenge, she does. At another point in time, we find a man named Alex Shepard being pushed on a gurney through some kind of demented hospital. When he is put in a room, he witnesses a doctor being impaled by a giant blade. Alex breaks free of his restraints and explores the hospital, finding what appears to be his younger brother, Joshua, behind a locked cell door. 
Alex tries to call out for his brother, but the boy simply ignores him. Alex unlocks the door and Josh runs. As Alex follows him, the hospital transforms into the other world, and Alex is forced to fend off attacking nurse monsters. When he finds Josh again, he's behind another locked door, and he asks Alex to find his toy rabbit. Alex finds the toy and retrieves it, bringing it back to his brother. Instead of taking the toy, however, the boy looks at Alex in fear and runs off. As Alex rides in an elevator to follow the boy, he hears a metal scraping, and the doors are suddenly opened by a large blade that impales him. Suddenly, Alex awakens out of this nightmare inside a semi-truck being driven by former Silent Hill visitor Travis Grady. Grady drops off Alex in the town of Shepherd's Glen and drives off, bidding him a farewell and good luck. Alex explores the town and finds it to be practically abandoned and covered in a heavy fog. He soon comes across another person, however, when he is surprised by Judge Margaret Holloway, who tells him he should meet with her daughter, Elle, while he is home. Alex returns to his childhood home, finding a flashlight he once gave his brother Josh after he had a bad dream. Alex then comes across his mother, Lillian, rocking in a chair and barely responsive. Alex tells her that he was discharged from the army after a short stint in a hospital. His mother then reveals that Josh has gone missing and his father has gone off to look for him. She then states that now, everyone is gone, and he looks down to see his father, Sheriff Adam Shepard's gun, in her lap. Alex takes the gun and promises to find his brother. Alex then hears something, and his mother tells him it came from the basement, so he goes to investigate. In the flooded basement, Alex finds the source of the noise, a monster he's forced to fight. He then finds his father's workshop, where he recalls being scolded as a child to never enter. Alex leaves the house and enters the nearby graveyard, where he fights through more monsters and travels through the tombs of the town's founding families, his own being one of them. Also in the graveyard, Alex spots somebody digging graves. When he emerges from the graveyard, he finds his old friend Elle Holloway, who is hanging missing persons posters on a communal board. While she is happy to see him again, she nonetheless chastises him for leaving for the military without ever saying goodbye. Alex asks about the flyers, and she reveals that every day more and more people go missing in the town, and Alex fears that the worst has happened to his brother Josh. Elle then gives Alex a walkie-talkie, and he continues on his search. Alex reaches a junkyard and meets the town mechanic, Curtis Ackers, and Alex gives him his father's revolver, asking him to fix it. Curtis also advises Alex to ask Mayor Bartlett about Joshua's whereabouts, since the mayor seems to know everyone's business, revealing that the man digging the graves was the mayor. He then gives Alex a handgun in exchange for the revolver as a trade. The pair then muse about how all of the clocks in the town are stopped at 2.06, before Alex heads back to the graveyard to find the mayor. When he reaches the graveyard, however, he finds Mayor Bartlett gone, so he examines the Bartlett family tomb, where he opens a crypt to find an old watch. Suddenly, Alex hears a loud siren, which inexplicably causes him to pass out. Alex awakens later to find himself at the entrance to the neighboring town of Silent Hill, also covered in a thick fog. Alex examines his surroundings to find his brother, who runs in fear into the nearby Grand Hotel. Alex follows and inside sees his own boogeyman, much like James Sunderland's, a large man-like creature with a pyramid-shaped object on his head and a giant cleaver, the same cleaver he saw in his nightmare of the hospital. The boogeyman spots Alex, but simply glares at him before continuing on his way. Alex finds Josh, but falls through a hole in the floor, landing in a room which transforms into the other world, where he finds Mayor Sam Bartlett, who also belongs to one of the founding families of the town. Alex hands Sam the watch he found, which belonged to his son Joey, who was also missing. And the mayor throws it onto the ground, where it absorbs into the dirt. Giant monster then emerges from the ground, and while Sam begs God for protection, the monster kills him in one blow. Alex is then forced to fight, and eventually kill the giant beast. As it dies, it falls through a hole, and Alex passes out, falling through as well. When Alex wakes up, he is locked in a holding cell in the Shepherd's Glen police station by the town's deputy, James Wheeler. Wheeler, just as confused about what's going on in the town, lets him out of the cell and the pair explore the building to try to find another descendant of one of the founding families, Dr. Martin Fitch. The pair get separated, and Alex soon finds Elle once again, protecting her from a giant monster. The pair escape into the sewers, where Elle reveals that her own sister is one of the missing. However, Alex loses Elle in the sewers, finding only a blood trail where she once was. Alex exits the sewers and receives a call from Wheeler on his radio, and the pair agree to meet at Fitch's office. 
On the way, Alex finds a very distressed Fitch holding a blood-drenched scalpel before he runs into his office. Alex follows and finds Fitch's collection of dolls before the clinic transforms into the other world. There, Alex finds Fitch covered in self-inflicted cuts. Fitch states that he plans to give his daughter Scarlet, also missing, a doll. Alex hands over the doll he found, and Fitch's wounds begin to take over his entire body as he drops the doll, which absorbs into his pool of blood. A mannequin-shaped monster then emerges and kills the doctor, prompting a battle with Alex. After Alex defeats the creature, he gets pulled into the pool of blood before awakening back in Fitch's office, now with a key adorned with the same symbol Alex had seen on a pedestal in the town hall. Returning to the hall, Alex uses the key in the pedestal to open a secret passage underground. He explores the passage and finds information about some kind of pact the town's founding families made with God, as well as the shepherd family's apparent excommunication. He then finds a ceremonial dagger, which he remembers as the key to open his father's basement workshop. Alex returns home and opens the door to the workshop, and inside he finds a key to the attic. There, Alex relives another memory, this time of his father giving Joshua a family heirloom, an important ring that he is to keep secret from everyone, including Alex. Alex then finds a letter from his father in the attic, detailing that the Order is somehow behind the missing people in town, and that he must fight this evil in Silent Hill. Alex questions his mother about the note and Silent Hill, but she only offers him her apologies. As he continues to press her for answers, the pair are attacked by cultists from the Order, dressed in hazmat suits. They kidnap his mother, but leave him behind as the house transforms into its other world counterpart. Alex is able to solve a series of puzzles incorporating his own memories before unlocking a giant door, returning the house to its normal state and allowing him to exit back into the town. There, Alex finds Elle, who states that her mom has also gone missing. Alex states that they'll be able to find all the missing people in Silent Hill before the pair receive a call from Wheeler, and they all agree to take a boat to the town. Aboard the boat, Wheeler expresses that Silent Hill has a bad history, recounting that when he worked in the Brahms Police Department, a female officer had gone missing in the town. Additionally, Alex and Elle's parents told them to never go there. Elle also reveals that her sister, Nora, went missing years ago as well. Unfortunately, as the boat reaches the pier, they are boarded and attacked by the Order's soldiers once again, who kidnap Ellen Wheeler before Alex falls into the water. After he washes up on the shores of Silent Hill, Alex gets a call from Wheeler, who leads him to the Overlook Penitentiary, where he is able to fight through the Order to rescue Wheeler. Wheeler reveals that he heard the cultists taking a woman to solitary confinement, and the pair surmise that this must be Elle. The pair split up once again, so Wheeler can man the security controls while Alex makes his way to solitary. When he arrives, however, he finds that the woman the Order spoke of was not Elle, but instead his mother, tied up to a large, torture rack-like device. She apologizes to Alex, telling him that she and his father could only choose one. The device begins to split her in two, and Alex pulls out his gun, deciding to either put her out of her suffering, or allow her to live through her gruesome death. Either way, the prison transforms into the other world, where he is able to regroup with Wheeler. The pair eventually find Elle's mother, Judge Margaret Holloway, tied to a chair. Alex releases her, but a monster grabs Wheeler and pulls him into a trap in the wall. Alex tells Margaret to escape while he saves Wheeler, and she runs off, glancing back with a sinister smirk as a door closes behind her. Alex tries to save Wheeler, but he is taken away as a giant monster emerges from the wall. Alex defeats it before seeing his brother run past. He follows Josh into a mysterious church. There, he finds a confessional where an unseen man describes his relationship with his two sons, one of which he describes as treating horribly due to a choice he made between the two. He explains that he had never let the boy see the good things in life to make it, quote, easier for him, but his reasoning is not revealed. Alex is then given the choice to offer this man forgiveness or not. Afterwards, Alex discovers a door behind the church's organ, and through it he finds his father, Adam, tied up to his own torture device. Adam tells Alex that he can't save his brother, and reveals that the dog tags around his neck aren't his own, but his father's. Adam explains to his son that he wasn't injured in battle, but instead was hospitalized for mental illness after an accident that occurred the night Adam gave Joshua the family ring. Adam then opens his hand to reveal the ring, which Alex takes from him. Adam then asks Alex for forgiveness as the boogeyman suddenly appears and cleaves Adam in half, killing him instantly before walking off. 
Alex follows the boogeyman, finding an unused hazmat suit which he uses as a disguise. However, his disguise is soon seen through by none other than Curtis, the mechanic from Shepherd's Glen, who knocks him out and drags his body away. When Alex awakens, he finds himself strapped to a chair before Judge Margaret Holloway, who reveals the dark secret behind all of the missing children in Shepherd's Glen. As it turns out, the four families that founded the town were former members of the Order, who left Silent Hill to start a new life in a town of their own. Still fearing the wrath of the Order's god, they made a pact with it to keep the town safe. That pact required each of the families to sacrifice one of their own children every 50 years. Mayor Bartlett sacrificed his son Joey, Dr. Fitch sacrificed his daughter Scarlett, and Judge Holloway sacrificed her own daughter Nora. Sheriff Adam Shepard was supposed to sacrifice one of his sons, but failed to do so, breaking the pact and cursing the town making all of the other sacrifices for naught and returning Shepherd's Glen to the Order's control. Margaret then inserts a drill into Alex's leg, but he fights her off, forcing her to turn the drill on herself before pushing it through her skull, killing her instantly. Alex escapes and finds Elle, similarly being tortured by Curtis. Alex is able to kill Curtis and save Elle, and they make their way out of the facility. On their way, they find Wheeler, still alive but stabbed in the chest with multiple knives. Alex can then save the man, provided he has the medical kit to do so. Alex then leaves Al to get Wheeler to safety, and heads off alone to finally find his brother. Alex soon comes across a crypt with tombs for each of the founding families, and etched on each are the names of the children they have sacrificed to the Order's God. Alex examines the Shepherd family tomb and is shocked to find his own name carved on it, revealing the true motivation behind his parents' treatment of him. Alex then finds himself reliving another memory. In this one, Alex takes Josh on a boat to Toluca Lake at night, and he teases the boy over their parents' coddling of the younger brother. Josh then takes out the family ring to taunt Alex back, but Alex tries to take the ring by force. In the ensuing struggle, Josh falls back and hits his head, concussing him as he falls into the water and drowns in Toluca Lake. Later that night, Adam and Alex retrieve Josh's body, and Adam scolds his son for what he's done. The father reveals that he chose Alex, but by allowing Joshua to die instead, Alex has ruined everything, and the whole town will suffer for his mistake. This event threw Alex into a mental breakdown, where he believed he could still somehow save his brother. Back in the crypt, the other world invades once again, and a giant, spider-like monster with a woman's face appears and attacks Alex, forcing him to fight the demented creature. After he emerges victorious, he cuts open the monster, and his brother's body falls out. Alex kneels before his brother and places the ring and his flashlight on the boy. He then apologizes to his brother before leaving him behind. Alex then exits the church, emerging from a manhole to find Elle outside. She asks him what he saw down there, and he simply responds, what I needed to, before the pair walk off. In the year 2010, an unnamed protagonist is surprised to receive a strange book on their birthday from an unnamed sender, postmarked from Silent Hill. The book, delivered by Howard Blackwood, contains all of the protagonist's memories. One night, the protagonist tries to rewrite their memories and finds themselves in an otherworld dungeon. After fighting through a bit, the protagonist finds Howard yet again, operating a store in the otherworld. Howard explains that the protagonist must find a material known as memory residue in order to change his memories. When the protagonist awakens, they find that the events they rewrote came true, but every night they return to the nightmare. They spend several nights fighting through dungeons based around their friends, family, and other acquaintances. Eventually, the protagonist comes across a creature that represents their own wants and desires, and they destroy it. Free of its guardian, the protagonist is able to either lock away the book for good or use it for their own benevolent or selfish means. At some point in the future, an unnamed man wakes up in a room with a concrete floor and walls. The room is empty, save for a table and some tally marks on the walls, which also contain a single door. The man walks through the door and finds himself in the hallway of a seemingly normal, albeit a bit messy, house. On one of the tables is a clock, stuck at one minute to midnight. A radio plays a broadcast detailing the grisly murder of two families by their respective fathers, and the man continues to explore the house. While the only door in the hallway is locked, 
Another at the bottom of a short set of stairs mysteriously leads to the same hallway he had previously entered. The man continues to loop through this hallway, finding each iteration to be slightly different than the last. Soon, strange things start to occur, like the locked door slamming open and shut, a baby's cry being heard, cockroaches crawling on the walls, among others. Soon, the man finds the locked door open and enters to find a flashlight inside a bloody bathroom. In the sink is a strange, fetus-like being, which is the source of the crying. The man goes through more hallway loops, finding messages written to someone named Lisa, as well as a photo with an eye gouged out. As the man looks above, he sees the specter of this Lisa missing an eye. More loops and Lisa sightings later, the hallway begins to change. Sometimes lights appear differently. At one point, there's a hanging fridge dripping with blood, and soon the hallway becomes an endless series of red corners the man is forced to run through until he spots a peephole into the bathroom, which he looks through and hears a grisly murder. Soon, the fetal creature starts to speak to the man about someone who got fired and drowned their sorrows and booze before their wife was forced to get a part-time job where she was apparently sexually harassed by her boss. After more loops, the man wakes up yet again in the concrete room, this time with a bloody talking bag. After he finds pieces of a torn photo and acts out several actions, a telephone in the hallway rings, and when he answers, the voice on the other end states, You have been chosen. A voice is then heard stating that their father killed their family, but they will be coming back and bringing their new toys with them. Afterwards, we see the man from the hallway walking through Silent Hill. He takes a quick look behind him before continuing on. This unfortunately concludes our very last visit to the town of Silent Hill. But as mentioned before, we have one more trip to look at. A re-envisioning of the first Silent Hill story, set in its very own universe, told for a different generation of players. Take it away, Jeffrey. In winter of the year 2008, we find psychiatrist Dr. Michael Kaufman preparing a drink for himself as a new patient arrives. His secretary calls to inform him that his patient is early, and he states that it's fine, and they can begin right away. Meanwhile, a man named Harry Mason is driving down an icy road before losing control, spinning off the road and crashing into a post. He unbuckles himself, but loses consciousness and falls to the ground. Kaufman starts his session with his new patient and asks them to start at the beginning of their troubles before handing over a quick questionnaire to get to know them. After the questionnaire, Kaufman asks the patient to tell their story. It's then that we see Harry awaken and as he stands up, he realizes his daughter, Cheryl, is missing from the car wreck. Harry enters and explores the nearby town of Silent Hill, looking for his daughter. He stumbles across the diner and inside meets a woman, in this case, Silent Hill police officer Sybil Bennett. He tells Sybil about the crash, but finds that he cannot remember much before that. Harry then hands her his ID, and they realize he lives on Levin Street. Sybil advises him to go home to check if his daughter is there, and if she isn't, to call state police in the morning. On his way home, Harry gets a call from Cheryl, in which she frantically tells him that he can't fight them before advising him to run. The town then instantly becomes covered with ice, and he is soon chased by monsters, and is forced to run through that same horrible game mechanic before finally escaping them, emerging through a gate to find himself at the front of his icy home. Back in Kaufman's office, the patient is asked by the doctor about their family and is then asked to color a drawing of a house just like their childhood home. Harry then comes up to his home, which is the same colors as the patient expressed in the office, and knocks on the door. A couple he doesn't recognize answers the door, and a very confused Harry begins to shout for his daughter. They say that they've lived there for 14 years before closing the door on him. Harry pounds on the door before Sybil arrives, having been called by the couple for being harassed. Sybil takes Harry in her car to go to the police station to figure things out, but the snowstorm gets too bad to navigate. Sybil exits the car to get a lay of the land, but when she doesn't return, Harry is forced to leave the car and explore the nearby forest. 
There, he gets a call from Sybil, chastising him for leaving the car. She then tells him to come back. The forest soon turns into another icy nightmare, and Harry is forced to run from the monsters once again, this time ending up at the football field of the Midwich High School. Meanwhile, Kaufman asks his patient about high school and gives his appropriate feedback to them. At the football field, Harry gets another call from Sybil, and the pair agree to meet at the high school's gym. Harry heads through the town and explores a bit before reaching the high school campus, where he makes his way to the gym. After finding it, he is surprised to find it is set up for a reunion, while a woman performs a song on the gym stage. After the song, the woman introduces herself as Michelle Valdez, and when Harry tells her his daughter's name, Michelle reveals that she went to high school with a girl named Cheryl Mason at Midwich years ago. While Harry is initially dismissive of this claim, as his daughter is only seven years old, Michelle shows Harry a photograph from the reunion display. Harry denies the girl is his daughter, while Michelle states that their resemblance is far too strong to be a coincidence. The pair then head into the principal's office, where Harry cracks the password to his computer and reads Cheryl Mason's records, learning that the girl and his daughter are one in the same and that they apparently moved to Simmons Street at some point he can't remember. Harry calls the number listed in the records, and a woman named Dahlia answers. When Harry states his name, the woman begins to panic, and suddenly the school turns into another icy nightmare. Harry runs through, learning that Cheryl's classmates had bullied her and smeared her reputation. When Harry escapes the school and the nightmare, he finds Michelle waiting for him outside. The pair then walk to the nightclub where Michelle works so she can use a car to drive him to his Simmons Street address. The pair reach the club and Michelle gets a call so she sends Harry upstairs to her room to fetch the keys to the car. He starts to receive text messages from Dahlia as he looks for the keys. He eventually finds them and returns to Michelle and the pair talk about his wife which confuses him, prompting him to take a moment in the restroom. When Harry returns, he finds another woman in Michelle's place. This woman introduces herself as Dahlia and is surprised that Harry doesn't recognize her. Dahlia then takes him outside to the SUV so they can take it to see Cheryl on Simmons Street. The pair drive off but are soon stopped by a raised bridge. Harry gets out and enters the control room where he is able to successfully lower the bridge. As the pair continue on, Harry presses Dahlia for answers to his current situation, but as she stops the car, she begins to freeze over. Suddenly, the bridge begins to freeze as well, and it collapses, plunging the SUV into the icy waters below. Harry tries to save Dahlia, but she doesn't move, forcing him to escape on his own, leaving her behind in the submerged SUV. Harry reaches the surface, but passes out due to his exhaustion. Back in Kaufman's office, he asks his patient about how they feel regarding death. After getting their feedback and playing a little game, he asks them to get back to their story. Later in the night, Sybil finds Harry and takes him to Alcamilla Hospital. When he awakens in a wheelchair being pushed by her, he explains what happened, but Sybil states that the bridge was closed and there was no way he could have gone over it. She also confronts him about his true identity revealing that she pulled Harry Mason's file at the station. Before she can finish her thought, she, along with the hospital, begin to freeze, and Harry is forced to frantically push his wheelchair to safety. After escaping this nightmare, Harry finds a crying nurse next to a crashed ambulance. This nurse introduces herself as Lisa Garland, and he walks her to her apartment. When the pair arrive, Lisa changes out of her scrubs and lays on the couch with a headache asking Harry to retrieve a certain color pill from the medicine cabinet in her bathroom. Harry is then tasked with the very hard job of remembering what somebody said mere seconds ago, Get me some yellow ones. And returns to Lisa with a pill, which he gives her. Kaufman then tells this patient a story before getting their opinion on who was the most and least guilty party in the story. Meanwhile, Harry leaves Lisa's apartment before continuing his journey to Simmons Street. Not too far on his way, however, he gets a call from Lisa crying out for help. Harry rushes back and finds Lisa dead on her couch. That is, if he gave her the wrong colored pill, because he wasn't paying attention to her, 
when she asked for medication. Get me some yellow ones. Not long after he finds Lisa dead, Sybil arrives and holds him at gunpoint. She tells him that she knows he isn't Harry Mason before the apartment freezes over and another nightmare begins. Afterwards, Harry reaches his home on Simmons Street and enters it to find Dahlia, now somehow aged several years. She is shocked to see Harry and he asks where Cheryl is. Dahlia states that his daughter went to the lighthouse, then reveals that she and Harry are married before she freezes over and Harry enters another nightmare. At the end, Harry finds himself in Cheryl's bedroom and he lays down on her bed before quickly passing out. In Kaufman's office, the doctor asks his patient about how they feel about marriage and divorce. After this conversation, Kaufman feels they're really making progress and the patient continues on with their story. Harry is awakened by Michelle and he asks her where the lighthouse is. Michelle offers Harry a ride from her boyfriend John to the lighthouse and they all drive off. Michelle and John begin to argue and John stops the car before storming off, after which Michelle follows, leaving Harry alone in the car. Harry exits and enters the sewers nearby and makes his way through to the other end, where he emerges and enters Annie's bar. Inside, Harry finds Michelle, who reveals that she and John broke up before telling Harry that he needs to find a boat at the jetty behind the Lakeside Amusement Park. Meanwhile, Kaufman finally asks his patient about the important stuff, sexuality. He gives his opinion on their stance and feelings regarding it before doing a Rorschach test. He then flips one of the cards to surmise that on the other side of sex is death, showing a drawing of a car crash. He then has his patient finish their story. Harry makes his way through the icy amusement park, finding a docked boat on the other side. Harry enters the boat, where he is surprised to find the young version of Dahlia. Harry tells Dahlia to take him to the lighthouse, but she asks him for something in return. She then starts the boat and lays on the bed. Harry sits next to her, and the pair kiss, before spending the 20-minute boat ride across Taluka Lake together in bed. Harry then awakens next to a frozen Dahlia. When he emerges from the boat, he finds the entire lake to be frozen. Harry steps out onto the frozen lake and begins to make his way to the lighthouse. On the way, the old Dahlia calls him and tells him to turn back for their daughter's sake, but he presses on. He then gets a text message from Sybil containing a mugshot of Cheryl Mason. Monsters begin to chase Harry and he runs faster and faster to escape them. As they draw closer and closer, they begin to overwhelm him, but they're hit by the light from the lighthouse and they are suddenly frozen in place. The lake then thaws and Harry swims toward the lighthouse, peering under the surface to spot various rock formations in the shape of events from his past. As Harry closes in on the shore near the lighthouse, he passes out from exhaustion. Harry washes up on the shore where he is again retrieved by Sybil. As she helps him up, Harry grabs her gun from its holster and holds the officer at gunpoint. Sybil states that she isn't there to stop him and instead just wants to find the truth just as much as he does. In Harry's file, she found that he died in a car crash 18 years prior, which confuses both of them. She then tells him his answers must await inside the lighthouse and he hands her back the gun as she walks away to let him finish his search. Harry enters the lighthouse before finding a door at the end of a hallway. He enters the doorway to find Dr. Michael Kaufman speaking with his 25-year-old daughter, Cheryl Mason. Kaufman explains to Cheryl that the story she's been telling him about her father is a fabricated one and that she needs to move on. Her manifestation of her father then walks up to her. She then tells him that he's been with her for so long as he simply replies, I always will be before he himself freezes before Cheryl. Outside, Cheryl finds her mother Dahlia waiting for her. The pair then leave to start Cheryl's new life. And with that, we come to the end of Suggestive Gaming's trip through most of the Silent Hill franchise. While we unfortunately never got to see a new beginning to the game series all those years ago, maybe someday we'll find an opportunity to travel back to Silent Hill once again.
Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching this one. It wound up being way longer than even I expected, so thanks for sticking through. If you like this video and would like to support the creation of more of these, please consider heading over to my Patreon or by becoming a channel member here on YouTube. Both links are in the description. You can also just leave a like and a comment letting me know you enjoyed it. That's great too. A huge, huge, huge thanks goes to the 2-bit players, Noah and Jeffrey, for their help once again. After the Resident Evil video, I knew I couldn't cover this franchise without them. As I mentioned before, these guys have the best Let's Play channel on YouTube, and I've watched through their playthrough of the first Silent Hill countless times, so click the button on screen now to watch it. While you're over there, you'd better at least subscribe to thank them for all their help. They deserve it. Thanks again guys, we'll see you next time.